do it. The right. disturbing We're case of the uh, Amazon well, here. Killer. All right. I'm letting you guys know My there's sorry. trigger warning here. Like there's gonna be you're gonna see some fucking images of, of someone in, in, in search on your property. Kidnapped. Okay. We have Kayla. We have Kayla in your property. She was locked in a I container. Told you. Okay. She has told us that you shot and killed Charlie. Okay, so at this time I'm gonna need you to stand up yeah, and put your hands behind He's your back. He's already You're under, okay. You're under arrest right now for kidnapping. What's up, Ewu crew? It's the Raven, here to share another shocking, interesting, or just strange, but very true story with you. This is Todd Kolhep. Between 2003 and 2016, he murdered at least seven people in South Carolina, and his story is one of the most bizarre I've ever heard. What you're seeing is Todd's taped confession, and less than a minute in, he says this. I'm just thinking it's kind of funny. What? At the beginning of all this? Right. You've helped us when you get back with my mom. Right. And I'm helping you solve the problem that just cleans the books up. You see, Todd agreed to tell the truth about his crimes in exchange for a few things. First, he wanted to talk to his mother and give her a photograph. And second, he wanted to transfer money to the college fund of a friend's child. There's probably not a lot we're going to be able to do for you. I don't know. Giving you a, a clear conscience is one of the only things we can... Honestly, I'm not worried about my conscience. You gave me what I wanted. What I wanted was to be have the opportunity to take care of my mom, whether my girlfriend accepts it or not, to at least attempt to take care of her and her kid. Do you, you still want that? me to reach out and talk? I have not yet, but do you still want me to reach out and talk to her to see if she wants to come see you or talk to you? If she would, please. Okay, I will. The biggest thing is please let her know that whether I screwed up, mm -hmm. I can't fix it. Mm -hmm. You'll notice he seems pretty friendly and gregarious on the outside, and the more I learned about this case, the more I realized that's kind of his whole persona. You see, if there was one word that I could use to describe Todd, it's cocky. He likes getting his way and receiving praise for his actions. In fact, many people theorize that the only victim who managed to escape Todd with her life realized this very personality trait and used it to stay alive until help could arrive. Her name is Kayla Brown. On August 31st, 2016, 30-year-old Kayla and her 32-year-old boyfriend Charles David Carver went missing. They just decided to move in together after a few months of dating. And in order to start building their new life together, the pair was looking to pick up some extra work on the side. Kayla goes, Oh, I know the perfect job. There's this guy, a real estate broker who I met through one of my exes a few years back. I'm sure he'll have something for me. And he did. Todd was a very successful man in the area after all, and he put Kayla to work cleaning houses for his listings. She was stoked to have the additional income, and the deal only got sweeter when Todd said he had a job that both she and Charles could take on together. This time, it was clearing brush at his own 95-acre property, which was only about eight miles away from his actual residence. When Kayla and Charles arrived, Todd simply instructed them to wait outside while he went into a garage on the grounds to get something. As they stood alone in the creeping silence, neither one had any idea that these few quiet moments... Murderous real estate developer, boys. Let's go. Let's get it. That's what I'm talking about. Nope, not Marjorie Taylor Greene, okay? But this guy instead. Been watching on YouTube for a long time, but two months subbed on Twitch. Smiley face. Out in the middle of nowhere, Least where the psychotic last thing they ever together. Over the next few days, the couple's loved ones started to grow concerned. Kayla's friend knew something was off when all her calls and texts went unanswered. But even when she visited Kayla's home and left notes on her car, there was no response. Charles was very close with his mother and they talked every day. So when she stopped hearing from him after August 31st, she quickly reported him missing. Soon enough, the couple's apartment was checked and although they were nowhere to be seen, their poor dog was inside all alone without any food or water. This just wasn't like Kayla or Charles. Something was seriously wrong. But even when the two were reported missing, there was virtually no trace of where they could have vanished. And then something really weird happened. Charles posted on Facebook. That's right. All of a sudden, just like nothing had even happened, Charles was back on social media with posts informing his friends that he and Kayla were expecting a child, that they had bought a house together, and that they were now married. 
He apparently also shared out-of-character posts about digging holes, sword violence for some bizarre reason, and chillingly the final lyrics to the Eagles song Hotel California, which finishes, you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. He shared strange posts like, I wonder if I said hello, how many people would say it back? Let's try it. Hello. What color ribbon supports the cure for people who can't keep their nose out of other people's business? And, sometimes late at night I dig a hole in the backyard to keep my nosy neighbors guessing. These all seem to be aimed towards deliberately provoking Charles's friends, and on this last post people commented, Is that what you did to Kayla and the real Charlie? And, Are you hinting at what you did with them? To make things even weirder, Charles's account was sharing and liking the missing persons pages set up by the couple's families, even promoting a fundraiser that hoped to hire a private investigator to look into the disappearances. None of this sat right with, well, anyone. The grammatically incorrect and mean-spirited post didn't sound like Charles at all. Not to mention the real Charles was barely ever active on Facebook before all these sudden posts. The account at one point even posted an old picture of the couple captioned, We're fine, which was soon deleted. On October 1st, a concerned friend commented, Where the hell is Kayla Brown? To which Charles's account responded, Kayla is with her husband, Charlie. Why can't she have any contact with us? And who is this? She doesn't want to. I don't believe that. I know Kayla. She's not going to just run away from gotcha. everyone. You Love or her should at okay. least let someone know she's alive. The people that need to know that we are okay know that. If you look at the timestamps on these comments, they're only minutes apart. Whoever was replying wasn't even taking the time to carefully think out these cryptic responses. One friend shared that they were sent a disturbing message from the account reading, I'm just missing to everyone else. We are both okay. There's only one person that knows where we are, the person that means the most to me and Kayla. She knows where we are and we are coming that way forever. Well, as you can probably guess, this wasn't Charles using his account at all. It was Todd trying to throw people off his trail, buy himself some time, or maybe, just maybe, he was doing this purely for the fun of it, like a little performance he got to put on. And the further we dive into his life, the more you'll see that Todd definitely cares a lot about how- Okay, this one is fucking insane, dude. I mean, most of them are fucking insane, but like, this one is somehow more insane. I feel like I say this all the time. Like, every time we fucking watch- Every time we watch one, it's like, it gets worse uh, than the previous one that we had watched. It's the most psychotic thing, dude. Like, fucking acting like the victims themselves. Like, it's, this is like the modern day equivalent of what, like, those uh, other dudes would do when they would, like, cut the fucking heads and, like, recreate scenery with their victims and shit. Having all the attention on him. But now, let's go back to what really happened that last day of August when Charles and Kayla showed up on the property. After going inside, Todd had suddenly re-emerged from the door, but the friendly facade that he was known for in town had completely drained. Now, he was dead serious, and as Kayla and Charles looked down, their hearts sank at the realization that he was holding a gun. Before they even had time to process what was happening, scream for help, or run, Kayla says that three bullets were fired right into Charles's chest. Kayla's whole world screeched to a halt and she could do nothing but watch. She knew in this moment she was trapped, all alone on the expansive property of an unpredictable killer, one who absolutely nobody in town would ever suspect to be hiding such a horrible secret. She was utterly silent and still from shock as Todd grabbed her, placed her in handcuffs, and then led her inside of a dark metal shipping container. This would become her prison. She was chained by the neck, ankles, and hands and would spend all day inside the box, except for 1 to 3 p.m. and 5 to 7 p.m. At those times each day, like clockwork, Todd would come retrieve her, bring her inside of a two-story garage on the property, and force her to perform sexual acts. She would be fed, allowed to use the bathroom once, and given a small container of water to clean herself. She looked for any opportunities to escape, but they never came. For Kayla, time was running out. This was the hell she lived in while authorities were trying to piece together the puzzle of where she and Charles had disappeared to. All the while, Todd's posts on his own Facebook account were getting weirder and weirder, and looking back, his strange and cynical words are very telling. He had some generally questionable posts like this one from September 15th, two weeks after Kayla and Charlie went missing. Reading the news, this person is missing, that person is missing, another person is missing. Oh wait, that person just went to the beach with a friend. Another person found with her parole violation boyfriend. In the event I become missing, please note no one would take me. I eat too much and I'm crabby, they would just bring me back. On September 26th, he once again took to Facebook to rant. 
In my family, you get backhanded for talking back or being disrespectful. Wonder what the punishment would have been if I had looted, burned cop cars, and threw stuff at people. When I messed up, mom beat my ass. Stepfather beat my ass when he got home. Next time I went to my grandparents, I got my ass beat. You just didn't act up. These kids and adults just don't know. Damn shame, too. They might learn to appreciate if they did. Needless to say, the hypocrisy of this post is pretty ironic considering all the horrible things Todd's done in his life. On September 30th, he posted, Just admit it, you look at the news, you see the political crap and the school shootings and just general WTH is going on. Zombie apocalypse is starting to look better and better every day. On November 3rd, he shared a post that really shows just how quick his fuse was, how he viewed almost every interaction through an angry lens, and really how much he loathed others, or maybe just felt better than everyone else. We need Ebola to come as a huge snowstorm, wipe out half the population, then melt away. Just tired of entitlement, rude-ass people for no reason, people who race to cut in front of you to slam on the brakes to make right turns, and that mother that stands in the aisle at the grocery store, and dude, you know who you are, that blocks the aisle checking out the micro-brews and blocking everyone on their way to their Michelob. B move. Notice how incredibly furious Todd gets when he feels that he's been personally slighted by random strangers. Remember this, because it will become extremely important later on. But despite Todd's obvious temper online, nobody would have expected in a million years what skeletons he had tucked away in his closet. It wasn't until authorities got a search warrant to access Kayla's Facebook account. That Bro, this motherfucker is just literally the most normal conservative, okay? This is just like, he's just boomer posting like a conservative. I swear to God. The picture would come together all at once. Investigators began searching the online profile for clues, and that's when they saw conversations between Kayla and Charlie about the job on Todd's property on August 31st. Now police knew what they were doing on that crucial last day, and when they went to trace the pair's phones, their worst fears were confirmed. Neither Kayla nor Charlie- No, the best, the best part is like, yeah, when, if, I was, if I was rioting, listen here, if I was fucking rioting, dude, I'd get- I'd get so fucking owned if I was out here riding, dude. Hey, it's like, dude, what do you mean? You I've literally kidnapped and murdered Let's go people. Murder time. You fucking kidnapped and murdered people, dude. It's just, yes, you it is chicken curry as always. Charles had ever left the area of Todd's property. Police now knew exactly what they had to do, but not one person was fully prepared for what they might find. At about 8 a.m. on November 3rd, one group of investigators went to Todd's house, where they spoke for a while with the man, both sides remaining a bit guarded, unsure what the other side was hiding. As Todd was questioned about what he knew concerning the missing couple, Kayla and Charlie, he didn't know that another team of investigators was simultaneously arriving at his 95-acre property a few miles away to scour it for evidence. However, at this time, the authorities who were with him did reveal to Todd that they knew the cell phones of the missing persons had last pinged on his property. Todd responded, you're trying to find the girl. The detective corrected him that they were looking for both her and her boyfriend. Guess Todd slept up there, as he was the only one who knew Charlie was already gone. Um, we have a search warrant, okay? okay. For your residence and your car, okay. okay? We are mainly looking for your cell phone. Okay. Well, me or, and at least him need to go in with you. Meanwhile, not long after arriving on Todd's expansive rural land, the other team of deputies drove down its long gravel road and came upon the two-story garage. When they went inside, they were immediately concerned to see that the makeshift living space was adorned by shackles. But then they came upon the thing that fully stopped them in their tracks. In the bathroom, inside of a lone wastebasket was a pile of hair clippings, reddish brown in color. Oh. They warily headed back outside to continue the search, but as the investigators came across Todd's looming shipping container and went to take a closer look, they were suddenly chilled to the bone by a strange noise. Someone was banging on the walls from the inside and they were screaming desperately for help. In that moment, the whole atmosphere changed. Deputies rushed to open the doors, but the container was tightly sealed shut by five heavy padlocks. Five this five. unforgettable video captured the few tense minutes where everyone held their breath, as a few men cut and pry open the locks and then, finally, they were in. Watch out, y'all move. Uh, 
The dark box was littered with supplies and crime novels, and in the very back, chained to the wall by her neck, sat a despondent Kayla. On top of the dog bed she'd been made to sleep on for the past two months, barely able to move as her restraints had forced her to stay sitting up almost all the time during her captivity. The investigators try their best to console Kayla as they get bolt cutters to set her free. Just a girl, just a girl. How are you, honey? This is bolt cutters. This is our best. He's a paramedic. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to get you out of there, okay? Just hang loose for me. Anybody got a, I need a handcuff key. Handcuff key. I don't I got it right here. Hold up. Y'all slide back. Hold on. He's got a light. We got to let him get pictures. Randy, let me see your light, Randy. You can put your hands down, sweetheart. You're okay. We're here, okay? But despite the extended trauma Kayla had just endured, her immediate response to being rescued was clear, coherent, and calmer than anyone could have expected. Her strength in this footage is beyond admirable. Do you know where your buddy is? Charlie? Yes. He shot him. He shot him? He shot Who him. did? Who sh Todd Colehep shot Charlie Carver three times in the chest, wrapped him in a blue tarp, put him in the bucket of the track. Oh my God. Walked me down here and I've never seen him again. Okay. He says he's dead and buried. He says there's several bodies dead and buried out here. And okay. he says that the dogs will be ruined if they go looking because there's red pepper. We're going to step you out, sweet dog, because there's what? Red pepper. Okay. Okay. Tell the dog people that. He says no, there's pepper this. everywhere around the car. The car is supposedly in a ravine out of the land. Okay. The investigators at Todd's house were alerted of the shocking discovery, and they quickly confronted Colehep, letting him know the jig was up. They had Kayla, and there was no weaseling his way out of it now. All right, this is where we're at, Mr. Colehep. While we were here, all right, my sergeant served a search warrant on your property. Okay. okay? We have Kayla. Excuse me? We have Kayla. Time to stop in your property. Trying to get banned. She was locked in a container. Okay. She has told us that you shot and killed Charlie. Okay. So at this time, I'm going to need you to stand up and put your hands behind he's, your back. He's already here. Right. Okay. You're under arrest right now for kidnapping. <laughs> the other cops already fucking uh, handcuffed him. All right. They're continue to search your property. They're <laughs> going to continue. To bring, they got cadaver dogs down there. Okay. okay. If you want to help yourself, tell me where Charlie's at. So we can go find his body. That's that's pretty much where we're at right now. Okay. Do you want to help yourself and tell me where the body's at so we can go recover Charlie? What now, motherfucker? Huh? Guess what, bitch? That guy who's fucking standing between you and Michelob Ultras. That guy didn't fucking murder anybody. Okay. Yeah. I hope you're happy. You sick fuck. Body. No, yeah, you no more Michelob Ultra for you, dude. No, sir. Okay. Why'd you shoot him? I didn't shoot anybody, sir. Okay, why'd you lock her in a container in your property? I don't stop. She's on your property right now, locked in a container. Uh -huh. They just got her out of a, like a, um, they called it a specific name. Conics box. Conics box. She was locked in a container oh, in a Conics oh. box. They got her. We are, we have investigators. We have like twenty investigators on your property right now, okay. and they have found her in the comics box. So she never left your property. Okay. Okay. You locked her in the comics box, and she has told investigators that you shot and killed Charlie. Okay. So I'm trying to give you an opportunity to help yourself and help us. Help you find this. Wow, this is a really good defense, dude. He, he's he's putting on a really solid defense. It's called the I don't know what you're talking about technique. Okay, very effective. Very, very effective. I mean, wow, my God, dude. Body. Because Charlie, she's saying Charlie's body, you buried Charlie's body on that property. So you're saying you didn't lock her up, you didn't put her in the comics box or anything. Um, probably a good thing. Go ahead and put him in the back of your car. Sir. Watching this clip, Todd seems almost frozen by disbelief, like he never thought he'd actually get caught. Authorities soon discovered Charlie's car also on the property, which Todd had spray painted and covered in debris in order to conceal it. Are you fucking kidding me, dude? That's all he did? Bro, I swear to God, like...
I guess you could literally fucking get away with this shit if you're rich enough and you have a big enough property and like depending on what area you're doing this, you know what I mean? Spartanburg. But he didn't even fucking try, dude. He, he was just like literally trying to... The only thing he tried was get caught. <laughs> Where's the car? I don't see it. Okay, stop. <laughs> Where's the car? I don't, I don't understand what you're saying. Where'd it go? Fuck, I almost caught the car. Now I don't know where it is. It's kind of weird to me that Todd seems to consider himself a criminal mastermind and thought out all these ways to keep his dirty deeds secret, but he didn't even seem to consider the possibility that authorities could ping the victim's phones and find him that way. One sergeant would later say that he feels Todd wanted to get caught so he could have an audience and tell people about his awful Wait, why the fuck didn't they do that ahead of time? What, what, wait, 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 wait. Why didn't they do that for months? Crimes. I might have to agree. As she rode in the ambulance, Kayla would reveal more heartbreaking details of her time trapped with Todd. One of the things I found... So Todd was right. They were like kind of not wrong. Like that's how fucking dumb the authorities were. found most disgusting was the harrowing way she described the sexual assaults. Both of the time This is seriously one of the most evil things I could ever imagine. Was Cops are like, wait a minute, I don't understand. German leftist represent. Cops are like, yeah, we do that on a daily basis. Is it still legal in South Carolina to sexually assault your, uh, like, rape your suspects? Let's see. Yes, chat. For those of you who don't know, sex under coercion is rape. Cops, until recently, in many different states, could legally have sex with their suspects. Yes, people that they've arrested. Okay, never mind. Wait, hold on. Police sexual misconduct, a national scale study of arrested officers? Hold up. Ron Watkins at it again. Love you, Hassan XOXO. Let's see. That is most, this is most definitely bullshit. New York only like a couple years ago made it illegal for cops to uh, have sex with their suspects and people that they've imprisoned and sexual assault in general. If you didn't know that, well, welcome to fucking reality, okay? New York... Fact check. Sex between police officers and their detainees isn't illegal in many states. Claim in 35 states, police can legally have sex with and rape detainees if they claim it was consensual. Is their eyes of the police reform viral, da 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 so what are they going to say? It's like, oh, here's the consent loophole in New York. <laughs> Our rating partly false. We rate the claim that police officers can legally have sex and rape individuals in their custody in 35 states partly false. Rape by anyone is illegal in every state. While it was true that 35 states did not have laws explicitly criminalizing sex between officers and detainees in 2018, many states have since passed legislation that criminalize it. Wait, how is that partly false then, dude? What the fuck? 2018 is when we decided, you know, we probably shouldn't do this. Now, uh, the second reason or for why uh, they have this, the second reason for why they have this is because cops will do like sting operations on sex workers. In which, you know, some of them fuck the sex workers, shit like that. <clears throat> I love this, like partly false, literally in the partly false literally in the description it says well it was true until 2018 dude
Bullshit, it's a morale thing like Astring not having sex with his patient, nothing to do with rape. You do propaganda bullshit now? Wait, what? Daddy. What? What the fuck? Misgive sister? Didn't you... Did he use to blame people living and referring to the past? Has the song reacted to JCS Andy Lee yet? Andy Lee already? Check the Andy Lee one already. Oh, this guy just only wants to fucking watch me watch murders and shit. Okay. Cops under any circumstance, under no circumstance can a police officer have sex with their fucking detainees. That is a coercive state in which the detainee is literally being raped. Kind of like... Labor under coercive circumstances, such as prison labor, is widely regarded as slave labor, okay? Just because you personally don't uh, seem to appreciate it as such does not change the reality, okay? If you're under duress, if you're under duress and the person who literally holds the keys to your freedom is telling you, I'm going to fuck you, there is no way that you can consent. It's like, it's like having sex with someone who's absolutely fucking uh, drunk out of their mind, blacked out drunk. He's leftist, so he's good. What the fuck are you guys, communists or what? What a bad take. You can still easily consent. You can. You missed my point. I didn't see your point. I don't know who the fuck you are. I don't know why you think I read your point and missed it. Okay. I don't know why you guys are literally not understanding the point I'm making. In this situation, the Amazon review killer was saying, hey, I'll just kill you if you don't fuck me. But if you don't want me to fuck you, then, you know, that's fine. I'm not going to fuck you because I don't believe in rape. And the reason why I drew a parallel is because that same coercive element, the duress, built into the situation within a kidnapping is literally the exact same as a cop being like, Hey, you know, I'll, I'll fuck you. It's all good. Maybe you want to get out. I'll fuck you. It's literally the exact same power dynamic. You have robbed someone top of, the alleyway. of their freedom. Doesn't matter if they're like justifiably robbed someone of their freedom or not. Ultimately the sentiment is you've robbed someone of their freedom. An arrest is a kidnapping? Yeah, an arrest is technically a kidnapping. It's just the justifiable one in a lot of circumstances. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Not only did he do unspeakable... Yes, an arrest is a legal kidnapping, by the way. Yes. ...things to her without her consent, but it seems like he somehow managed to convince himself that this was not assault, probably in order to feel less guilty and pathetic and in turn make Kayla feel even more worthless. Simply unbelievable. And it just goes to show, once again, the mental gymnastics a narcissistic person like Todd would do to believe that his victim genuinely wants to be intimate with him, even though he's literally putting Kayla's life on the line if she doesn't comply. He apparently also told her that Stockholm Syndrome would kick in and she'd be happy with him, and that he'd plan to build a soundproof room for her to- Oh my god, this guy is like exuding Redditor later. energy, dude. Um, actually, I read somewhere that Stockholm Syndrome will kick in and you'll start enjoying this. It's like, dude, fuck you, dude. Live in long term. Kayla also revealed that Todd liked to brag that he was a serial killer and a mass murderer and that his dream was to get his body count in the three digits since it was supposedly yeah. only in the high two digits so far. Just listen to these bizarre claims that Todd allegedly boasted about to Kayla. Oh my god getting upset about people fucking protesting calling them rioters incredibly active on facebook constantly dude this guy is a, oh god it's doing the thing again oh god it's doing the fucking thing again chat i hate it when it does that thing i hate the cc like catches what i'm saying it's fucking creepy anyway 
LARPing is a fucking paramilitary contractor. It's literally just the textbook fucking... It is the textbook 60-second ad break that I just remembered, so I'm shoving in here, okay? But he is literally the fucking textbook conservative on the internet. He's like, yeah, I'm a paramilitary guy. You know, I kill people. He's like, no, you fucking didn't. You're a real estate developer. Okay. Um, yeah, my dashboard is open and my dashboard has my, uh, stream. So it's like automatically picking up the audio from my stream. I think anyway, listen, folks, it's top of the hour. Every hour is every six second ad break. If you, if you no longer want to see the ads, all you need to do is subscribe. Okay. You can subscribe for $5 or for free with a Twitch prime. Or you can use an ad block or a VPN. However, Twitch Prime is free if you have it. Here's the ad break now. Let's keep going. I really don't know where the whole killing people for the government thing comes from, but I'd guess it was just a fabrication Todd made up just for the sake of attention. So this was the big case that finally put Todd Colehead behind bars. Yeah, this guy's unaware of like conservative rhetoric. That's why he doesn't get it. Conservatives do this shit all the time. But as authorities continued speaking with him, they would discover that the rabbit hole of Todd's life was far deeper and darker and more evil than they could have ever imagined. First of all, shortly after being taken into custody, Todd would lead police to a site on his property where two more corpses were found. Authorities were shocked to unearth what? Johnny Coxie and his wife, Megan McGraw Coxie, a young couple who had been missing since December 2015. Autopsies revealed that Megan died from a gunshot wound to the head while her husband received a fatal wound to the torso. To make matters even worse, while it was determined that Johnny had been killed immediately, Megan had been kept alive for six days before Todd brutally murdered her on Christmas. Upon further research, it appears Megan and Johnny had just been released from jail shortly before they went missing. And with various sources reporting that they had a history of panhandling and that their baby tested you, positive for heroin, you kind of get the feeling that Todd specifically preyed upon people he knew were at a bad place in life and particularly vulnerable. Now, Megan and Johnny may have had problems of their own, but of course, when Todd told the story of how they died, he framed it in a way that made him look like the good guy in the situation. Well, sort of. Todd gave investigators this play-by-play -play in his confession. You pick them up at Blackstock, and you know what? You pick them up at Blackstock and Rebel Road, Rebel I think you said, and then that's, well, okay, no, let's sir. start. I met her there. Okay. Got her number. We talked on the phone for a brief moment. Okay. Then I met them later on at that next to Ricky's Hot Dogs, big huge parking lot. They walked across okay. and spoke to me there. Okay. I almost thought she was going to hit on me to actually. Come on, I shut the in our car. Don't you guys feel any embarrassment being trash and chat and in TTS all day and being full of shit while Haas and I be trying to give us juicer content? A lot of you guys are being a disgrace to me. What? And to others who are trying to enjoy the stream, you people make me sick. Is that an XQC juicer copy pasta? Because I love that. I wish more chatters said stuff like that. Um, but that's not what I was there for. I got you. I'm going to tell you, our meeting looks shitty as shit. <laughs> I understand. I mean, I got you because you show up with, with that. In that parking lot? Yeah, and her kind of the way she was. I understand what you're talking about. Um, basically, I offered her the job, offered to let him go in and do it, can work as well. The next day, she well, the next day. This was over several days. The next day, she was in the paper, mug shots. I guess you guys had arrested her for um, meth or some sh uh, hair. I don't know. Something was in her bloodstream, and you took her kids away. Okay. I asked her about it, and she informed me that yeah, she had drug issues, and with that. Okay. I still was gonna give him a chance. You know, I get. Happens to people, it's hard. I get it. Uh, and I picked them up and I drove them to my land of it, get supplies mm -hmm. and got them down to my building. And that's when Johnny pulled a knife out mm -hmm. and you shot. I shot. What'd you do with his knife? Oh, no, I don't keep that kind of crap. You just threw it out? But yeah, that's right. Okay. I, what did she do when you shot Johnny? What did she do when Johnny pulled the knife out? What did Nothing. you say? Nothing. So you think she was planning on the planning of this? He's so smart, but doesn't realize that like you can fucking do an autopsy and figure half this shit out. It's a lie. I think she entirely was in the plan of it. Okay. 
there was there was no oh shit. yeah uh, Johnny what are you doing there was mm -hmm. none of that there, this was her actions were she knew he was doing that mm -hmm. they saw a guy who had a load of money driving mm -hmm. a car they can't afford mm -hmm. they didn't have a car and they were going to get something so then you shot him how many times Shot him twice. Okay. Thank chest. you, Ella F. Okay. for the five gifted subs. He dropped subs. forward. Mm -hmm. He dropped forward. I went around him and put another one through a spinal column. Okay, and you shot Bro, this is like... He's literally living out his, like, conservative fantasies when it, that's not what happened. You know what I mean? Like, he's just basically... Living out his you fucking fantasies, up. like this is how he imagines he would fucking uh, behave in a situation where he's like being attacked or something. So he's just LARPing. Her. Not exactly. Do you believe Todd's version of events? To me, it seems like he could have easily done the exact same thing to this couple as he did to Kayla and Charles. Just attack them unprovoked in order to keep the female party to himself. Even the way he tells the tale seems like an excuse to humble brag about how much money he has. After all the heartless crimes Todd has committed against innocent people, I just don't know if I can buy this. But it is true that Megan and Johnny had a sketchy record, and it's not too unbelievable that they could have tried something. Either way, I really doubt that Thank Todd was very 41. upset when he got the opportunity to kill. Next, Todd goes on some random tangents about how his property and storage container was never supposed to be used for such gruesome purposes, which is just a pretty bizarre topic to ruminate on after everything he's done. The Connex was not meant to be a cage. Okay. All that changed was after the fact. Okay. Connex was designed for my food and my weapons. Oh, there it is. And he's a Y2K doomsday prepper. This guy is like, this guy's everything, dude. This is awesome. This guy's literally everything that conservatives are. Like, wrapped up into one big fucking tubby meme, okay? And to secure my four-wheeler before I had the building built. Okay. The back area that's all wood, mm -hmm. that wasn't designed for them. Mm -hmm. That was designed for my stuff. Okay. Until last... Why are you telling this? Uh, is this to imply that, like, you were... I was actually saving them, officer. I was saving them from doomsday. Saving them from uh, Y2K. Thank you, S Max 10 for the 10 gifted subs. And thank you, Sepsis Bear, uh, for the five gifted subs. Week, there was no ceiling on that. Okay. I put that in because she was cold. Kayla was cold. And Todd just loves talking about all his stuff. I went down to the Connex, cleaned out the back area, because mm -hmm. I had all in there. Mm -hmm. Um. And at one time, those ammo racks weren't there. The ammo rack was and here. And you my name for the five years mm -hmm. stuff. Pistol rifle. Okay. You know, I had chain around. There's lots of chain in that building. Mm -hmm. I use chain for all kinds of shit. There's chain in the, in, in the woods where I've got trees. I don't understand. Like, is he trying to get credit? Like, is he trying to be like... I, I, I just don't get it. Like, is he trying to get fucking credit for... Uh, what do you call it? For not like murdering her immediately or something like he's like oh you know, i took six months i took care of her she was cold so i decided had. like you know she should no longer be cold so i put a roof over that connex these would come along that are sort of lean towards my fence mm -hmm. and i'll put a chain around it come along to it and start working this way and over a period of time it'll fall away right. from the fence okay uh, so chain and cable and that kind of stuff, I got a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's pause right here. Todd is obviously very proud of all his gear, and he clearly has kidnapping down to a science. But before we go any further with Megan's story, you need to see the backstory to all this equipment. And it's actually... So, now, are we now gonna find out why he's called the Amazon Review Killer? Because, oh my god, dude, I've been wondering, it's been 25 minutes, and I'm like, why the fuck haven't we seen anything from Amazon so Probably far? the most bizarre thing about this entire case the Amazon reviews. Yep, that's right. When investigators looked into Todd's internet activity, Shut they discovered the something absolutely up. insane. Todd had been buying the tools for his crimes out in the open on Amazon, and he left public reviews where he described exactly what he was using them for. The crazy part is, anybody who read these creepy reviews probably laughed it off as just some dark humor. 
On a master padlock review, the review read, Solid locks have five on a shipping container. Won't stop them, but sure will slow them down till they're too old to care. On a fixed blade, haven't stabbed anyone yet, yet, but I am keeping the dream alive and when I do, it will be with a quality tool like this. On a master lock, works great. Also, if someone talks back, go old school on them by putting this in a sock and beating them. They will not appreciate the hardened steel like you will. Works great on, looks like he said shipping container. Keep in car for when you have to hide the bodies and you left the full size shovel at home. Does not come with a midget, which would have been nice. Works excellent. Getting the neighbor to stand still while you chase him with it is hard enough without having an easy to use chainsaw. It's blacker than my soul and priced right. There was even a review that read, now my locks have locks. Place is Hotel California now. Guess Todd was a big fan of that song. What would you have thought if you saw these on Amazon? Would you have been concerned or just brushed it off? Either way, all of Todd's reviews just further demonstrate how smart and funny he fancies himself as, what and how much he what? wanted to brag about his crimes, even if he had to do it in this roundabout way. But moving forward with Todd's 2015 crime, this next clip is very disturbing and disgusting, as Todd describes how he decided what to do with Megan. It really feels like he views his victims as nothing more than objects, which he can dispose of whenever it gets Hello, is on XQCL. Can you say XQCL? Say it now. No. I will not say it. Convenient for him. I didn't know what to do with it, man. Um, one side, I really want to drop her. The next side, I really... It's not <laughs> I kind of want to save her ass. Mm -hmm. Let me back up real quick before we go that far. Because we were talking about Johnny. Okay. The girl that was with Johnny, did you shoot her? Not at that time. Okay, what happened with her? She panicked, but then she said, I told her to sit down. She sat down. Mm -hmm. uh, went ahead and cuffed her. Mm -hmm. Patted her down, mm -hmm. told her I wasn't going to hurt her. Mm -hmm. uh, she calmed down, mm -hmm. and I actually took her to the Connex. No, that's not true. I had her lay there for a while. I didn't know what to do with her. Um, I didn't want her in my Connex because I had stuff in there. I didn't know what the hell to do with it. Mm -hmm. Putting her in with my guns is not a good move. No, I don't understand that. Uh, I actually had to go. For the first time, I was having a little bit of a panic of what the hell do I do with her. Mm -hmm. Uh, put her here, put her there, drop her, what the hell to do, do I call the cops, oh, shit, I got legal guns. Uh, I told her I wasn't going to touch her, wasn't going to her, wasn't going to her, uh, just calm the hell down and let me sort this shit out. Mm -hmm. Somewhere between, I did that, I, well, I shot him, set the, the back tight in the back, got her to calm down, and kept coming back and forth trying to figure out what to do, but I had her cuffed, mm -hmm. and she wouldn't go anywhere. Eventually, I went and... I want to say I left her on that floor for a while. I left her on that floor cuffed. I would not. Mm -hmm. Cops were like, you could have gotten a job with us, brother, if you weren't doing, you know. Should have, should have just joined the badge, brother. You should have joined the force. Because I didn't know what to do with her. I didn't want her in the building. Okay. Got the tractor, got it out of there, picked the body up, and was trying to figure out what the hell to do with it. This um, is Johnny's body? Yeah. Okay. Um, like I said, I was held with a meltdown. And listen to how much more concerned he is about losing his sanctuary than he is about murdering people. The land was supposed to be my sanctuary. Yeah, not my killing field. Right. <laughs> it was not meant to be my killing field. Um, it was supposed to be the place where I go to relax and get away from people and not deal with this. Mm -hmm. shit. Um, this this killing really bothered because it was such needless. This is called the mm-hmm technique. Or all you do as a cop is say, mm-hmm, over and over again, as the murderer reveals every single minute detail of his life. Uh, hell, give him money. Why were you robbing me? He thinks this violence was all needless and stupid. Mm -hmm. Pretty ironic, considering all the people he's killed out of petty personal grudges. You'll see what I mean soon enough. It's all about what works for Todd. He goes on to nonchalantly describe burying Johnny, saying... It was a lot more work than you think. Then he wasn't sure what to do with Megan. I tied her up, left her there. While I tried to figure out what to, I, I didn't know what to do with it, man. Right. Um, got rid of Johnny, came back, left her there, went and got food, fed the girl. Um, oh, fed her after she tried to rob you? Man, what are you gonna do with her? I don't wanna shoot her. I understand. I mean, I can't have some crazy bad woman going back. I mean, she was going bipolar left and right. She wouldn't calm down. Like, oh, she finally calmed down. 
But she, would, when she was talking to me, and first she had drug issues, right? And then she kept going off the deep end with weird shit and kept talking, and then she kept telling me that she had manic, manic mode or some sort of bipolar lithium crap, I don't know what the hell it was, where, she, I mean, she was up, down, up, down, up, down. So she didn't mellow out like Kayla did? No, not at all. She did finally calm down, but she wasn't upset. What made you decide to shoot her? I'll get to that. Okay. Mm. It's clear from the way Todd tells this story, almost with a sort of glee, that he has no remorse. Even here, when the investigator tries to get him to cut to the chase and tell them why he shot Megan, he just said, I'll get to that. Like this is some juicy drama he's been dying to share. Then he complains about all the stuff he bought for Megan while keeping her captive. Uh, I wasn't going to shoot her. Okay. I was going to give her money. I don't know why the hell she went the hell off. I held her. I hate the kidnapping part. I did another one. I held her there for a couple of days. How many days? Five or six. Every, every other damn day, she wanted Little Caesar's Pizza. I ate that shit. They always give me heartburn. Little Caesar's Pizza, Mountain not Mountain Dew, Dr. Pepper, cinnamon rolls, and friggin' Newports. If you go down to my building, you'll find an unused package of Newports that I bought for her. And then you went back. She took. She tried to light my damn building on fire. Do you know how? In the back of what building? The comics. And then this part is just kind of weird. While telling the investigators where they can find the cigarettes, he bought Megan in the storage container. He says something extremely weird and unprompted. Oh, there's a collar in there. That collar was Kayla's. Neck collar? Yeah, she had me order it. She asked you to order it? Yes, sir. Okay. It, we'll get to that in a minute. Didn't use it because after, after it came in the mail, mm -hmm. I would say it went. Oh. Okay. That's sticky for me. <laughs> it's it, it's a stainless steel collar with like hooks for putting like locks on. I mean, <laughs> dude, it's like having the, your. I don't treat my dogs that way. Okay, so let me explain the backstory for this one because it's really strange, and I was very confused at first too. Todd actually claimed that Kayla had been writing letters to him while she was in captivity, asking for intercourse with Todd himself even telling a reporter, I'm not saying she's not a victim, she's not the victim she portrays. I mean, it turned into Fifty Shades of Grey with bodies. So I guess that's where this supposed caller comes in. Because you made this comment to me, sorry to interrupt, but you made this comment to me, and I believe you. Hmm. You didn't do it. No. And I believe you, and I talked to the solicitor about that. Mm -hmm. and, and I told him what you told me. I, I said, he's, he's made the comment to me, solicitor, he'll plead to everything. But he's not pleading right because he didn't do it. I said, he told me that he's admitted to everything he's done. He's willing to take the responsibility for it, but he will not take responsibility for the kidnapping. I said, but he will not take responsibility for it because he did not believe her. That any time they had sex, it was consensual. She had the choice, and she actually initiated it at times. And he said, okay. I said, so... We're going to need to re-interview her, <clears throat> and we're setting that up. Yeah, we're going to do that this week. I told him, I said, I, I gave him my word that we would re-interview him, and I want to re or we want to re-interview her, mm -hmm. because that, I think it needs to be done. She had me get her vibrator, the TV, the, the DVD player, the MP3 player, the coloring books. I said, coloring books? Adult coloring books. Okay. Dude, I didn't question. I just it got her to shut up and got her to roll over. <laughs> uh, oh, that led me to something else. I want to say. You said the satanic book. Yeah. What the hell, man? I've never. Let me ask you this: the mattress is up against the wall, and we did that, looking to see if there were any weapons in there. There was a bag. Yeah. Did you ever spend the night there with her in the bed? Like stay the night, you and her in the bed overnight. Never stay the night. Okay. Um, we spent a lot of time on the bed. She wanted the the the, the, the comforter thing that was on the floor. Mm -hmm. That was her idea. That was her submissive kitty bed, her kitten bed. Man, it tripped me out. All of a sudden, I, I put the collar thing on her. And yeah, they found me. Uh, they were like, what? They thought it was for a dog, you know. 
But now the cage that was up there that's in pieces, mm -hmm. that I built, and mm -hmm. it was originally meant for my dogs. Yeah, no, I'm talking about the, the collar, the, the metal collar thing you told me about. That I ordered off mm -hmm. of one of the websites delivered, and I got it because she want, she requested that as opposed to me putting the chain around. Mm -hmm. And I got that and went, mm -mm. I, I went, that ain't going on no way. Uh, but she wanted that and then the, the, the kitty bed, and she went this whole thing of explaining to me that I had to give her permission to speak to me, mm -hmm. give her permission to look at me. Mm -hmm. Dude, I'll do all that in trouble. You know, I'm like, as Ashley, Ashley's never had to deal with any of that crap. Yeah, it was just, I don't know, she, 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 she had all this stuff, she kept asking for this kind of stuff, I got it, and she wanted, it's a big black book, about that deep, mm -hmm. like $23 that damn book, mm -hmm. and it's the Enchanted Sorcerer, Sorcery, so mm -hmm. it's the how-to guide to be a witch. Dude, I just, just figured she read the damn book, and she'll go for a while. Kayla has before asked me to beat up people for her, or use my resources, which she thinks my resources are go get someone killed. Really? Yeah. With people that she doesn't like. A. He have, a have you do or have you hired somebody to do it? Yes. Both? Yes. Okay. Matter of fact, read my Facebook. You may be on there. Really? Yes. You know, How long ago was this? You know, I, well, I blocked her after all this shit so they wouldn't know. Because, I mean, literally. Well, we have her Facebook page. Then you have it. Okay. Uh, it'll take you forever to damn day to go through it. Okay. But go back to the messages. Really? Uh, and her phone messages. She supposedly had money in her car, and the guy took her money, but that's full. And then she wanted me to either use my resources to either have him killed mm -hmm. um, or beat up. I believe he was beat up, but she wanted me to use my resources to have him, have him off or go do it. Kayla uses that thing between her legs to get dumbasses to go do stupid And that's what I'm trying to say, that she's going to use that to get Dustin hurt. So, yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that out of respect for the victim. But I haven't seen any of those letters or anything to suggest Kayla was there consensually. What I will say is that even if such letters existed, who's to say that Kayla wasn't just appealing to Todd's ego to stay in his good graces and save her own life? After all, she herself has stated, I realized it was easier if he thought things were going his way, so I made him think whatever I had to. Plus, Todd had reportedly warned Kayla that there was a woman who he'd kidnapped before her who hadn't been so lucky to make it out with her life, which brings us back to Megan. Unsurprisingly, Todd said a gross and totally unnecessary sexual remark about Megan, too, during his confession. Told her basically that if she would just chill the hell out. Mm -hmm. You don't know me. You don't know very much about me. You don't have shit. And last time I could check from what was online, she had a warrant when they were looking for her ass. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you a warrant for $4,000. I'll drive you up to damn Tennessee. I'll drop your ass off somewhere. If you got any common sense on this planet, you'll go left and I'll go right. What'd she say? Oh, she got so excited, I got my sucked. She did? Yeah. Okay. And it wasn't bad. I told her I would give her $4,000 and basically release her in Tennessee. Just go. Please, go. Don't come back. It's cringy and horribly sickening at the same time to hear him talk so proudly about these things. It's like he thinks the investigators are his buddies, which just shows how large his ego truly is. He goes on to say that he thought his plan to set Megan free would work since she didn't really know who he was. And because of her sketchy background, she... It's so fucking psychotic because, like, he, not only is he a gigantic piece of shit and a kidnapper and a murderer, but then he's also talking about this as though, like, she was into it. Like, what, what is he thinking? He's just like, he thinks that like, you know, maybe if I chum it up with these cops, they'll think like, hey, we do that all the time too. Fuck it. Yeah, let's just let you go. And like, can you imagine fucking being uh, the victim in that situation and like hearing that shit in the court when they're using it as evidence? It's like, it's like a fucking double jeopardy. Okay. It, it's like, not double jeopardy. Sorry. It, it's just, it's like doubly fucked up. And not only that, but the other thing I was going to say is like, he's, he's basically just fucking bragging about this shit to the cops about like what he did. I don't even, he thought about Stockholm syndrome to kick in eventually, but he didn't even, he wasn't even able to do it. 
that's the thing that I'm trying to say is that like he literally was like, hey, Stockholm syndrome will kick in eventually. It never fucking did, dude. It literally never did. He's such a fucking gigantic, pathetic piece of shit that he couldn't even do Stockholm syndrome. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, fuck. Monthly multiplier, not double jeopardy. Yeah, he's so fucking shitty. He can't even do Stockholm kid, uh, syndrome. A recognizable uh, uh, diagnosis for people who are like kidnapped over an extended period of fucking time. Not just, just average conservative. I swear to God. You're such a big streamer. Oh my God. What the fuck? I never seen such a big streamer minus iron mouse, but compared to you, she's nothing. Dude, are you familiar with this platform that you're on? There's like so unlikable. He can't even trick people into liking him. Yeah. He, he's so unlikable that he couldn't even fucking get like Stockholm to kick in for the person. Wild. It's but not as wild as like fucking crying about the shit he had to buy for her. You know, I was buying all this shit. It's like, dude, here's a really easy way to avoid that. Okay. Don't fucking kidnap people. I don't know. It's kind of like how you can avoid the ads at the top of the hour that come at the top of every hour. You know what I mean? Like just fucking subscribe for $5 or for free with a Twitch prime. If you have a Twitch prime, it's free. Like you will avoid the ad break. You know what I'm saying? Like, or you could use an ad block or a VPN. There's like many different ways that you could do it. It's like, don't kidnap people. If you don't want to buy them shit, uh, or, uh, you know, subscribe to the Twitch Prime for free. If you want to avoid the ads, this is how it works. Here's the video. You now. probably wouldn't want to go to law enforcement for help, but somewhere along the line, Todd changed his mind. So with Megan, you, you, you made her the offer of the $4,000. Keep your mouth shut. I'll take you to Tennessee. Drop you off and leave you. Drop you off and leave you. You go one way, I'll go the other way. Totally. What made that change? What happened? What made that change? Well, she ended up dead. Oh, you mean what, what work seated? Yeah. That makes sense. I wanted to get rid of her. The weather went. Mm -hmm. uh, we were having sleet. It's right before Christmas, man. We were having sleet. We were having rain. Mm -hmm. The weather went to sh Okay. And I still had to find a way to get away from Ashley, my girlfriend, mm -hmm. long enough to get up out of work, get this person to Tennessee, drop her off, and get home. That's not, a, that's not just a couple hour trip. No. And I'm dropping her, it ain't gonna be at the border. Mm -hmm. We're going north of Nashville. I want her way the hell away from me. She was gonna take it, she was happy. She was happy as hell for like two days. Okay. She was happy as hell. I just couldn't get past the weather. Okay. The last day I went over there, uh, opened the Connex up. She burned half the freaking building. Uh, this, I mean, she took my ammo racks and grabbed them and did this. Oh, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna, for such a little mm -hmm. damn. So then what happened? Uh, well, there was ammo everywhere and stuff everywhere, and she broke the fan. I, I, I got her a fan. She broke the fan. Mm -hmm. Prime, man, you just can't beat that shit. Two, they're two day shipping. There was a fan in there now, but it came as a two pack. Mm -hmm. uh, I had her those to get air ventilation. Mm -hmm. I got lanterns for her so she'd have light. Mm -hmm. I did the best I could to make it right. somewhat livable. Mm -hmm. Got her blankets, got her pillows. She lit the damn thing on fire. I'm surprised she didn't fix the gate. Well, that's what I was thinking. I'm surprised she didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, when I walked in the building, I mean, I was choking. Went to get her out, and then all of a sudden, it's like I had a caged animal on my hands. I don't know what the hell, what the hell. She went from I'm so freaking happy in the world to be I'm going to go to Tennessee with money, and I'm going to restart my life, and thank you, thank you, thank you, mm -hmm. to bad crazy. At that point, I tried to walk her out of the building. I just had enough. I walked outside. I was trying to calm down her. What the hell to do with it? What to do with it? What to do with her? I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I came back in the building. Um, she was going nuts. It wasn't like she was emotional about the situation. This, this had been days. It wasn't much about that. It was just like serious chemical imbalance. And she walked outside. I walked her, I walked her outside. I walked her outside. I put a 40 in the back of her head. What gun did you shoot her with? Same one. That you shot mm -hmm. Johnny, Johnny Red, Red. Mm -hmm. and that's a Glock, and that's the same one you shot, Charlie. Charlie, it's not even my favorite gun. Just it's just it's a it's a handy it's gun. A handy one. It's very effective, especially if you shoot 108 grains. 
And sadly, that's how things ended for Megan. Todd's temper got out of control, and just like that, Mr. Nice Guy was no more. Later on, a former co-worker of Megan actually revealed that the victim had met Todd while working at her Waffle House job. And when authorities started digging deeper, they were told that Todd would act so creepy at the restaurant. And by Bro, this guy is way too over-reliant on the mm-hmm technique, okay? This cop, like, what would he do if the criminal just decided not to tell him everything? Like, I feel like these cops have done absolutely nothing. You just, mm-hmm, yep, yep, that's right. That's crazy. Tennessee, oh, that's wild. That's far drive, isn't it? That, mm hmm. Very good. Inviting waitresses to his home and leaving large tips in a bid to get their attention. That a male. Kind of like me. The that's crazy technique that I use. Actually started taking Todd's orders whenever he'd come in, just to keep the waitresses mm -hmm. safe and more comfortable. Another is detail concerning Todd's romantic life that will send a shiver down your spine is something Kayla revealed when rescued. So apparently Todd had had an ongoing relationship with a woman named Holly for about 10 years. Sources say it was an affair and that she was actually the person who paid for the storage container Kayla was trapped in. But Holly never suspected that her lover was hiding a gruesome second life from her, saying only that he gave her a lot of attention and made her feel very important. However, when Holly found out about Kayla's kidnapping and watched the footage of her being transported to the hospital, she was left speechless at this line. Some girl named Holly is supposedly planning to kill her. Who knows how many more victims could have fallen prey to Todd if authorities hadn't stepped in to stop him. Even Kayla could have been days or hours away from becoming another voiceless victim of Todd's unpredictable wrath. But you know, all these stories of how creepy Todd was while also simultaneously being a respected businessman in the area really caught my attention. But to understand how this masked monster was made, I had to take a look back at his early years, and although the unspeakable things he did even back then left me at a loss for words, it all led up to his most brutal crime of all, a quadruple homicide, one that plagued and puzzled the community for 13 years and wasn't solved until Todd proudly confessed to police during his interrogation. We'll be going over that infuriating footage next, but first you really need to understand the absolute disaster that was Todd's childhood. Todd was born in Florida in 1971, but raised in South Carolina and Georgia. He didn't have the most normal childhood as his parents' marriage was crumbling and they were divorced when he was still a baby. Growing up, Todd reportedly loathed his stepfather and wanted to live with his biological dad, despite having seemingly no contact with him for about eight years. And because of these unfortunate circumstances, or maybe something that had always been broken within him, Todd started to behave in very concerning ways early on. He was violent towards other children and showed signs of severe emotional and mental instability. He would destroy classmates' property at school and was actually sent to a mental facility at the age of nine due to his sudden explosions of anger. Throughout this counseling, Todd was described as being preoccupied with sexual content at a disturbingly young age. If you're a true crime fan, then this won't be surprising to you at all, but Todd was also known to be extremely cruel to animals as a child, often a telltale sign of a psychopath. Not only did he heartlessly shoot a dog with a BB gun, but he also killed a goldfish with Clorox bleach because he wanted a gerbil instead. He even locked another young boy in a dog crate and rolled the cage while laughing until the child was in tears and begging him to stop. Todd's father would later lament that the only emotion his son was capable of was anger. His mother must have been well aware of this as well because she later described locking him in his room at night and placing locks on her own bedroom door just in case he decided to try anything. She also said he stabbed a little girl on the school bus in the leg with scissors to get back at her, destroyed a bunch of new furniture his mother bought him with a hammer, and even threatened to kill her. Still, in 1983, Todd got his wish of reuniting with his biological father after purportedly threatening to kill himself otherwise. But this ended up being just another bad influence on Todd, as the man apparently taught the boy how to blow things up. But despite bonding over shared interests, living with his father didn't play out like Todd had dreamed it would. The man's frequent absence due to his many girlfriends left Todd thinking it would be better to return to his mother, but at this point she made excuses to prevent this. This clip from Todd's police interview shed some light on his rocky relationship with his father. My dad took me to office parks while he would steal half the shit his hands on and then want me to help him load truck and deal with his nonsense and then would tell me that if I got into a fight, if I didn't win, you're not my son, don't come home. But then if I get into a fight, when I whoop the kid's ass, I went too far, I'm getting my ass whooped because I went too far. 
Also in his 2016 interrogation, Todd spoke on a shocking incident he got into around this same time of his teenage years. You had mentioned to your mom mm -hmm. and that we, when we had talked at the jail that there were others and you told your mom she didn't have enough hands. I had some altercations in Arizona. Okay. Um, I don't remember all the details. I had a friend of mine that got shot come out, coming out of a alleyway. Okay. I found the guy later on. Who was your friend that got shot? Uh, Michael something. I was a kid. I don't remember. Michael something. Do you remember the guy that you shot? I never knew his name. You never knew his name? He, he drove a Nova, a gray Nova. What year was that, you think? Well, how old were you? 14. You were 14? What's it then? Okay. Um, and my, my understanding is there was some kid who wanted to be in a gang and was doing his initiation. And his initiation was to shoot your friend? We were just two kids coming out of an alley. We weren't part of nothing. We were part of nothing. That was his initiation? Yes, sir. Wow. And so, in October 1986, Todd was still in Arizona living with his dad when his violent tendencies would extend to a new extreme. He was only 15 years old, but he managed to lure a 14-year-old neighbor girl whom he had a crush on out of her home by saying her boyfriend wanted to speak to her. Then he held a gun to her head, brought her home, tied her hands with rope, taped her mouth shut, and sexually assaulted her. After this, he walked her home and threatened her not to tell anyone what had just happened, or else he would kill her little brother and sister. I was like, those fucking violent gangs, man. They're so terrible, these guys. They're doing such violence, dude. You know, unlike me, when I do it, it's just, you know, it's, it's normal. Eh. Luckily, somebody ultimately... It's a complete psychopath, dude, at the age of fucking 14. Like, what do you do? What do you do with this guy? You can't. You, you just got to put, put him in the fucking freezer. You know what I mean? Just freeze his ass did call the police and when todd was apprehended the first bro i love this. this is my favorite thing dude i swear to god my favorite fucking thing is just like people literally losing their fucking minds like dude please dude please add cc to the channel please dude please it's like and then when i have it half the chat's like it's not correct if there's no cc on the fucking video probably because it's not doing a good enough job the cc is not doing a good enough job Please, I'm deaf, you jerk. Motherfucker! If you're deaf, how did you fucking... What do you mean? You're literally hearing me then. Or at least you're like able to fucking read my lips. The fuck do you mean? I never wrote it out. Hassle. He's still talking. It's saying CC for you. I'm gonna fucking... That's not funny, man. That's literally not funny. There's like actual deaf people in the fucking chat. What the fuck? That's so fucked up, First dude. thing he had to say was, how much time am I going to get for this? And get this, Todd explained that his motive for the disgusting crime had been because he was mad at his father, who was out of town and wanted to rebel. At this time, he was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Okay, now I want to take a brief moment to touch on Todd's late mother, because some of the things she said about her son's behavior are a bit odd to me. Before he was sentenced for this crime, she wrote to an adult probation officer pleading for leniency on Todd. According to Greenville News, she claimed that the incident had brought her and her son closer together, as he wrote her frequently while in jail, musing, You know, it's strange. Maybe a little good does come from some bad. She also wrote, They don't stop to think that he even walked the girl home. Does that sound like a dangerous criminal? He even walked the girl home. While she may have had decent intentions, I just feel like a statement like this would be a slap in the face to the teenage victim and her family. Ultimately, it was recommended that Todd be tried as an adult, with one neighbor even describing him as a devil on a chain. And here's what I find really interesting. When evaluated, Todd was found to show deep emotional disturbance, but not psychosis. This would seem to suggest that Todd was not, in fact, out of touch with reality, which makes his detached behavior that much more chilling. Overall, the psychiatrist determined that Todd had an inflated ego and was extremely rebellious towards authority, someone who generally feels like he should be in control. And there's one other key element that might play an underlying role in all of these big ideas Todd holds about himself, his IQ. When tested, Todd was found to have an above average IQ of 118, although interestingly, his high school teacher reported poor academic performance. 
It seems to me like Todd just felt like he was better than everyone, above the rest of the crowd, and rather than apply his intelligence okay. towards positive goals, he used it to manipulate people and orchestrate heinous crimes. In this case, even the juvenile probation officer would end up recommending adult incarceration as they did not think Todd's deep-seated issues could be solved easily, and Todd agreed to plead guilty to kidnapping in exchange for the sexual assault charges to be dropped. If that's infuriating to you, you're not alone, as one probation officer went so far as to say this was a travesty of justice. Another official declared that Todd had little to no conscience and presented the greatest risk to the community. It appeared that Todd believed the world owed him something. Very few held hope that he could be rehabilitated. Well, as much as we can wish someone had locked Todd up for longer so he couldn't hurt anyone else, that wasn't the case. Unfortunately, he only received a 15-year sentence, and when he got out at 30 years old, he moved back to South Carolina and was placed on the sex offender registry. Interestingly, while incarcerated, Todd had only been cited for violent behavior in the first few years of his stay, but throughout his 20s, he had no other records of disobedience, almost like Todd had learned how to put on a friendly act in order to get what he wanted. Upon release, Todd hit the ground running, paving a new life for himself. He had earned a bachelor's degree in computer science while in prison, and in 2002 he got a job as a graphic designer for a sports apparel company. Todd went on to get another degree in business administration marketing, and in 2006 he applied to receive a real estate license. But there was one little problem. Applicants were required to explain any history of criminal convictions in order to obtain the license. However, Todd had a clever plan. There was no background check in place, and so when Todd explained the felony on his record, he twisted things to sound way better for him than the reality. He painted it as a petty argument between his teenage self and his girlfriend, saying they broke up, and then her dog got loose, and then when they were looking for it, the girl's parents got worried and called police. He said the only reason he had a gun was due to concerns over gangs in the Phoenix area, and that the kidnapping charge was due to him telling her not to move while they talked this out. So, yeah. Just a complete lie, but a very deliberate one which fit all the parameters that would reasonably explain his charges without revealing the awful, ugly crime he actually committed. Well, this fabrication worked out for Todd, and after getting his bearings in the real estate scene, he even started his own business called TKA Real Estate, which employed about a dozen agents. His career was booming, and on the surface, he seemed like a pretty charismatic, hardworking guy to those around him. But still, his darker side leaked through the cracks at times, and people soon started to take notice. Co-workers were very uncomfortable with how he would casually watch inappropriate adult videos at work for hours, and some women felt uneasy at the sexual innuendos he made to them. He even made a distasteful- Okay, so, for the people who are watching this and going, dude, fuck this, like, you know, rehabilitation doesn't work, I need to repeat this, and I do every time we watch, like, criminal shit, but, um, like, this is an edge case. Like, this is a dude who is- in my opinion, volcano, demonstrating volcano, like volcano, a volcano, lot of volcano, the, volcano. in my expert opinion of watching criminology videos and being like personally obsessed with psychopaths, he just has like all of the fucking makings of uh, someone with anti personality, dem uh, anti. How do I fucking say this? He has all of the makings of a sociopath or a psychopath, okay? Antisocial personality disorder. Is it, did I say that right? I'm forgetting words right now. Yeah, just, you know, uh, it's just a Scorpio, okay? That's what it is. What up, man? Full joke on his firm's website that he motivated workers by not feeding them. Apparently, he was very open about his status as a sex offender, but would claim the charges stemmed from a girl's dad getting mad and overreacting after the teens took a joyride together. Again, very far from the truth. But all the same, Todd had glowing reviews, was described by many associates as very personable, and even got recognized as the top-selling rookie agent in his region at one point. All in all, his strange habit- That's the- that's sexism in the workplace, by the way. Like, the fact that- Like, the fact that not a single person was like, Yo, dude, you're being fucking a psychopath. Like, can you stop? Can you fucking chill? Like, not a single person checking him. Like, that's that's what women mean when they say, like, you know, some dudes create a hostile work environment. This is what the fuck... This is the dude. This is who the fuck they're talking about. Do you understand? That's an unusual quirks. We're that's right, Blizzard. ...up to, well, just that. 
So it wouldn't be until his 2016 confession that authorities would find out a brutal and high-profile quadruple homicide that they'd been struggling to solve since 2003 had been all Todd's doing. Now, can, what I want you to do is tell me from the very beginning about Superbikes. It was a warm afternoon in November 2003, Spartanburg County, when an unsuspecting customer walked into the store, Superbike Motorsports, only to be faced with a horrifyingly gruesome scene. All the employees staffing the shop had been shot to death. Terrified, the customer quickly called the police, who hurried over to inspect the bloodbath. Okay, what's the problem? Apparently, everybody's been shot up here. Everybody's laying down We're in a pool of blood. His mama's been shot, the mechanic's been shot. And the owner. The victims were quickly identified as the shop's owner, his mother, and two young workers. But as much as their devastated loved ones grieved and hoped for justice, the killer behind such an audacious and reckless shooting somehow managed to slip through the cracks. And as years went by and authorities racked their brains fruitlessly for answers, going down a few dead ends in the process, they had no idea that the real monster behind this notorious unsolved crime was hiding right under their noses the whole time, as a respected member of the community. And so, in this 2016 interrogation, they're finding out the full extent of what re it's also another like it's also yet another glaring example that like as long as you're fucking rich right as long as you're rich like people literally just do not suspect you of being a criminal like you're rich you're white <clears throat> you're in good standing with the community by default and you could just be like, I'm doing crimes all the time. You don't understand. I'm fucking doing crimes nonstop. I can't stop myself from doing crimes. I love criminal shit. It's all I do. People are like, yeah, there he goes again. He's being crazy. Okay, he's being crazy right now, you know? Look at that man. He's so crazy. He's like, I'm literally doing murders nonstop. Can you believe it? <laughs> You're so funny. Really happened that dark day at the motor shop. And the real motive was probably the last thing they ever expected. So, go ahead. You bought the bike. Bought the bike. Uh, I tried to ride it. It didn't work either way. Um, key points. Um, had it 14 days, and it got stolen from the front of the apartment complex. You said you went back to them? Uh, before it got stolen, I had gone back to them uh, a few days prior to it being stolen and told them that I was having a hard time riding it. And I was not so sure I had made a wise decision. And you went back to them because you were inexperienced. And what else did you say? I, I thought it was a bad decision. I was trying to see if I could possibly trade it in for a smaller bike <clears throat> or something of that nature. Maybe I just, I don't know how to ride it. Uh, they were, please understand this has been many, many years. Um, they proceeded to give me well, on the rude side about uh, my inability to, to, to ride a, that kind of bike. No one ever taught me. So, I mean, I, I did not operate the clutch. And the possibility of them coming by at some time with a trailer and maybe I'd make up my mind, that they, they had dropped it off at the apartment. Okay. So they knew, they knew exactly where it... Okay. Going forward, I'm sorry if you're deaf. All of these fucking ableist pieces of shit are fucking crying about the CC. We're not watching. We're not it's using the CC anymore. Over to me. So okay. You said they knew where it was stored? They knew it was stored. Okay. Because they had dropped it off there. Okay. Uh, two, three days later, it came up missing. There was a police report. As far as I know, they never found the bike. It's pretty obvious that Todd's anger stems from him being miffed at what he saw as the employees looking down on him. And for some reason, that seems to be the one thing Todd just can't tolerate. Watch here as he even gets sidetracked to complain about the police not taking him seriously when he reported the motorcycle theft. You said I made a police report? I did. Actually, the law enforcement officer made fun of me. He informed me that that's, that's, that's a shame it got stolen before I did. Before I got a chance to write you a ticket. That was the one time I didn't like you guys. Todd says a little while after that incident cooled down, he was once again making visits to the motorcycle shop. Got to Jones again for motorcycle and started going back to the shop. During one of my times over there, sitting on one of the, I believe it was the manager, the owner's friend, guy was a bit of an asshole. I was looking at the bikes and trying to let the earlier part go, and the manager 
started making some comments about the last one being stolen. And he okay. said something something about mine was on its way to mine was on its way to Florida. I gotta point this out, but like The wildest part of uh, deaf chatters or like chatters with, uh, who are hard of reading, like you can literally use the same fucking thing I'm using and you can hear me talk or not hear me, but like you can read me talk. Like you could just straight up use the exact same thing that I'm using. It's an incredible fucking tool. So whenever people fucking write like, dude, what the that's fuck? Where's the CC? I'm like, well, back. dude, you, you, you have a fucking opportunity to be able to hear everything. Like, why are you fucking yelling at me? It just comes with Google Chrome. It's not like a, it's, it's literally called live caption. It's Steam. on Google Chrome. It's a Google Chrome tool. They can't hear you right now. No, they can because live caption is incredible. I have no idea what's important or why he said that. When he said it, it was obviously he was not talking about the time when I asked him about possibly selling it, it, it was implied that we took your shit. I let it slide for the time being, got mad about it, <clears throat> kept going out there. Why I kept going to the same bike place, I don't really know. But I'd go out there, sit on the bikes, and listen to these two, the owner and the manager, yes. basically talk trash. I find this part so intriguing because even Todd himself admits he doesn't know why he would keep going back to the bike shop if the employee's attitudes bothered him so much. Part of me feels like he just wanted a reason to get more and more agitated so he'd feel justified in what he was about to do. To the workers, Todd was just some weird customer who kept coming in and acting strange, but they never could have predicted the absolutely evil plan that was simmering just below the surface. Waterbury 92 FS. Beretta. 92. Some of them are deaf though. Bro. Deaf chatters literally know about this and are using it right now. It's motherfuckers who are ableist themselves that one, portray themselves as deaf. And two, uh, ableist, doubly ableist because they're using my ADHD to stun lock me. Okay. That's it. Guess what? If you have, if you're hard of, if you're hard of hearing, and you're coming in here and writing about a bunch of shit in the chat like, oh my god, why aren't you using CCs? You're not using CCs when I already do. When you have every opportunity to use a CC service on your own, which you probably are using, you deaf chatters, or uh, worse, non-deaf chatters, are fucking being ableist. Because I have ADHD. And I'm hyper fixating on, or whatever the fuck uh, teenagers talk about nowadays, on, on bad comments. And you're writing it and you're taking advantage of my ADHD. Okay. And it's ableist. Eight months. The ones who are ableist portray Let's themselves go. as deaf. And then they're using ADHD to stun like me. If you're hard of hearing and you're typing shit, I already use ZC. Good one. Baba Jack draws. Yes. Uh, nine millimeter. Ten. At the time, those only had 10 round mags. Yeah. I hit like... the deaf chatter of the reverse Uno for ableism. That's right. limitation and the aftermarket pro mags were god awful so how many maps so you had 10 with 10 round magazine yes sir three of them three 10 round magazines mm -hmm. although i've got quite a few of those kydex mm -hmm. they work very well uh bravo consumer mm -hmm. highly recommend them he gives a long-winded explanation of since when do you have adhd dude you've been a subscriber for three months shut the fuck up idiot about suppressors a suppressor would cheat on a semi-automatic. The irony is someone who's ESL, I have to, I need fucking subtitles to see. Assist if you have a movable barrel. Okay. Otherwise you have to use a spacer. I can't just like hear it. I need to have a subtitle on my own. He's understanding it and you're just going, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then declares that he made his own. Dependability surpasses everything else. Okay. Years later, I actually learned how to make it myself and actually mine were. Then what happened? Uh, it's almost funny how the investigators just cut Todd off whenever he starts to ramble about his accomplishments. I feel like a big motivator for Todd was getting the recognition he felt he deserved. So these utter dismissals during his big moment to tell his story probably feel like a big letdown. 
Anyways, here's where Todd finally tells the methodical timeline from the day of the crime. I left college, left my class, okay. drove to Bowling Springs, put the shoulder holster on at the CVS parking lot. I'm not going to worry about the school. Got there. Not everybody was there. Went in. Uh, Bro, this is also wild. Like, this guy did so many crimes, dude. He's like, hey, I'll tell you what, you think I just did this one crime? Guess what? I did like the same crime four times, okay? I've been in jail. I've done the crimes. I've done all of them multiple times. You understand me? That chain is holding on stronger than your belief in God right now, dude. I sat on a few bikes, did my usual, and doing my best to make sure that the paying customers were not there. Collateral damage is not cool. Todd really harps on the point that he didn't want to kill paying customers, which seems to be his way of painting himself as a sort of anti-hero. Like he really seems to relish in viewing himself through this lens. You said you were waiting on what? This was during the time, as you know, that it was not busy. Mm -hmm. That's just time that was not after work when I would have a lot of people in there. Um, did not want to shoot up people. It's kind of funny. Kay would put on her paperwork when she was writing stuff out to me that she found a killer with a conscience and a kidnapper with morals whatever the hell that meant you remember that yeah so i just said i did yeah, not I, after she said i spent a lot of time thinking going wow kind of okay so as Todd waited for who he judged his innocent people to leave, he was also waiting for one of the employees who he felt wronged him. To I swear to God, this is a video of like when conservatism goes to its last destination. He's like, he's such a LARPer. He's all in on like vigilante justice. You, he thinks he's in the moral right, even when he's doing murders and kidnapping. He has no respect for marginalized groups, whether they're like fucking addicts or women. And like thinks he's yeah, doing them uh, a good, good deed by kidnapping them. Got put in my recommended. I just it's just final stage conservatism, bra uh, conservative brain rock. Like who pulled me deeper and show up. Into race Once he was ideas. alone with the workers, Todd says he asked to buy thing. a bike so that the mechanic would take it back to prep it. And then he says one of the most outrageous things the police have probably ever heard. That was one big building. Yeah. I cleared it in under thirty seconds. You what now? I, that I love the chatter who said women are marginalized question mark bro we literally just watched not Has five it. minutes ago this man be like a routine sexual harasser in the workplace and create a hostile work environment for all the women that worked alongside him and not a single person was like yeah that's kind of fucked up dude like they literally gave him awards for being good at sexual harassment. Okay. They were like, here's the, here's the horn dog award of the year. And you're like, uh, I don't understand. Like what, what happens to women in the work? <laughs> like, what happens to women? Like they're not oppressed. 30 seconds. You got a little bit proud. Oh God. He's such a sorry, LARPer. The interrogators brush oh, he's off such a, He's a top his... LARPer, dude. Look at him. Story continues. He says he first went to the back where the mechanic was prepping a bike. Okay. Walked up, put out the Beretta, put the safety off. Shot the mechanic twice. Downward angle. He was he was beneath me. He was down, crashed down on the, this side of the bike. Bike was here. I'm on this side. So I had to lean over the bike and I believe it was two, two yeah, shots. Um, here he brags about how good his shots were. I got him in two long, two long shots. Okay. I got each long. You got him in two long shots. And the cops are like, "Why don't you just join the force, brother? What the fuck? You know, everything you did could be technically legal if you just joined the fucking force. Love you know, the boys in the blue, brother. Seems a lot like a fucking missed opportunity to me. Yes, sir. If you can get up from that." Then, unprompted, he offers up the reason why authorities weren't able to find fingerprints in order to brag once again. The reason why you didn't get any fingerprints is on the door, I used my knuckles instead of my hand, my hand to open the door. And the reason you have no prints on any, on any show casings mm -hmm. is I wear two pairs of gloves when loading every firearm, even in practice. Okay. Even my practice, I am doesn't get fingerprints. 
That's why I don't have to worry about picking up shell cases. If you wear one pair, you can still have a lean print because of the acids in your finger. In regard to that, when they touch, you still, if you have that, if you had any chemicals on the outside of that, whether you had touched first before you touch it, I don't understand. It, even though you didn't, you had gloves. If you wear a glove on top of a glove, it causes friction between the two of them and negates that. So when you're talking about gloves, you're talking about latex gloves? Yes, sir. But if you wear two pairs, not That's one, uh, one pair won't work. So you use two pair of gloves? Yes, sir. Latex gloves. After that, Todd went to find the other victims. Okay. At that time, all three, manager, owner, and the mom, they had heard the gunshots in the back and were coming this way to figure out what had happened. I had all of a sudden, I had three people in front of me. Mom was the closest, and I shot her two to three times in the chest. Not my best work. Her pattern was horrible. She was actually surprised. Three. At her being there, I think my pattern was horrible. In the chest. Not my best work. The pattern was horrible. You can truly see Todd's narcissistic side ah. coming out in these words especially. The whole thing was just like a game to him, and he really wants these officers to be impressed. She, she fell. The son and manager, son, the, the owner and the manager ran up in the door. At that range, they should have ran to me, not away. They were way too close. When I came around that door, it was boom, three people right there. Okay, so then what happened? They ran to the door. They ran to the door. Um, in the process of that, mm -hmm. I emptied, topped a few rounds, topped one. I don't know which one was which. In the in the process. Process of them running. Of them running. Of them running. Of them running. Is the average gun nut conservative when he can't fucking like find like a fourteen year old black kid to kill? as they're running away just so they can like get away with a murder you know what i mean get a legal kill this is just what it happens when you just have like like horniness for fucking murder and that's why you, you turn around and you're just like yeah look at that it's got good grouping it's got a good spread it's like i did great grouping on that it's like dude you fucking did murders bro you're such a piece of shit i popped. you can almost see todd's impatience here he really wants to tell his story. It's like this confession is the performance of his lifetime, and he doesn't look too happy to get interrupted. Luckily, any time he tries to go off on a tangent, the investigators pretty much ignore it and bring him back to the straight facts of the case. Then proceeded to go, did a reload. Mm -hmm. While this guy was still running, this guy, but I, when I hit him, mm -hmm. he crumpled into the doorway. Okay. When I did my reload, before this guy got out, mm -hmm. I put two in him before, he, before, and he actually fell outside. That was a very fast reload. Todd says he might have put an extra round in the guy who fell by the door as he walked over him, but he's not sure. And then he says something so chilling and insensitive, I almost couldn't believe my ears. At any point, did anybody, I mean, was there, there was nobody else. Okay, there was nobody else, but did anybody, as they were falling, I mean, did they did they look at you? Did they face you? What the fuck kind of question is that, too, though? Did, did they say anything to you? Was there any conversation, don't, please, whatever, no, sir. with any of this? I don't remember hearing any of that. I, I will tell you that once I engaged, I was engaged. Okay. Um, so it's like, at that point, it's almost like a video game. It's not a game, but it's almost like you... You're focused on, you've been there, sir. You know what I'm talking about. Absolutely insane. Oh my God, if the cop says yes, I know what you're talking about, I'm gonna lose my shit. I can't imagine what must have been going through the detective's heads at this my point. Boy. Todd says he then walked around and put one last round in each victim's forehead, got in his car and drove home. He took the gun apart, put its parts into parts of his trash and even cat litter, and then disposed of that evidence in the dumpster. If it hadn't been so long, you guys could have actually pulled records and actually gone to figure out You've been there, cops like, yep. Where they put it, but at this point, it's kind of a new point. When the detectives go on to clarify some points, Todd just finds every opportunity to make it up. I wonder why this video skipped the cop's reaction. I would have liked to see how shocked they were when he said, Bulls. You know, you know what I'm talking about.
I'm sure that they were disgusted. ...about himself. Moving targets, multiple moving targets. I don't think I missed. If I did, it wasn't more than once. Okay. Um, but I mean, it, it's not an easy shot when you got two... This guy's just a mega cop larper, dude. The only difference between him and, like, the fucking dudes is, like, you know, maybe 15 to 20 pounds, give or take, and also just the law. That's it. Like, that's why this is, this guy is literally, if Kyle Rittenhouse hadn't done what he did in, in, uh, Kenosha, this is what he would be doing. Like 10 years down the line. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. The badge, the only difference between him and uh, him and this dude is 15, like I said, 15 pounds. on like the law badge qualified immunity. Not true. There's also three weeks of training. I bet you that motherfucker trained more than the cops. What are you talking about? LARPers unironically train more than the cops do. I mean, look at the way he's talking about it. He's like, I was so tactical. You don't understand me. Moving targets running faster than they can. I may shoot somebody as one thing, right? but I'm not a pistol whipping and, and beating somebody is not my thing. He even makes a point to say he wasn't initially planning. Oh yeah, that's that would be unbecoming of you, dude. Yeah, I, I would never pistol whip and beat somebody. I would never do that. That's uh, that's got that, that's dang, gosh dang unacceptable. You you hear me? On shooting the mom, like that gives him some sort of brownie points or something. I actually wasn't meaning to hit the mom. You actually what? I was not meaning to hit the mom. I prefer not to shoot women if I can. I refuse to shoot a kid. But then Todd's dark sense of humor comes through every now and then to remind us how he really feels about his actions. I still got the t shirt. They give you a t shirt? They did. I can't be. I'm not a trophy guy. You're not a trophy guy? Mm -hmm. They wanted to give you a trophy? No, sir, that was oh. actually. I gotcha. <laughs> um, I don't keep trophies. But at this point, nothing is too shocking coming from the man famous for saying, my golf game was weak, my kill game is strong. What might be most frustrating about the Superbike case in the end. He's such a fucking loser too, like. I, I don't even want to give him the reaction that he wants, which is disgust, right? Like he's saying that because like he wants people to either think he's cool as fuck, like he's Punisher. Also, did the cop just laugh at him saying that? Hold on. Trophy guy. You're not a trophy guy. <laughs> they wanted to give you a trophy? No, sir. That was oh. actually... I gotcha. <laughs> um, I don't keep trophies. But at this point... Love this community hassle. Okay, maybe he's not laughing, but he was, he was being real cordial. <laughs> it was like more of an uncomfortable laugh, but... Um... He's trying to, one, he wants half the people. My kill game is strong. He wants half the people to fucking think he's cool. And the other half to be disgusted with him. When in fact, like, or, or fear him, you know what I mean? When in fact, he's just like a fucking idiot. Like, he, he's like a pathetic fucking loser. Like, he's nothing. You know what I mean? He, he's not anything. Like, he's a guy who very desperately wanted, like, attention and did all this because he fucking wanted attention and because he thought he was like smart enough to be able to get over it or get away with it and then wanted to be able to you know be written in history i guess and nothing is too shocking coming from the man famous for saying my golf game was weak my kill game is strong what might be most frustrating about the Superbike case in the end is that during the 13-year-long investigation, one asset that police gained was a sketch of a potential suspect that a witness, presumably a customer who had been one of the last people at the bike shop that day, had described. The witness remembered this man filling out paperwork to buy a particular bike. In 2012, the sheriff held up a newly revised sketch and said, I'm going to be bold enough to say this is my man right here. This is that picture. As accurate as it may be, it unfortunately wasn't able to catch Todd before he committed his- As accurate as it may be. Bro. I don't want to be ableist. 
but no wonder they couldn't catch this motherfucker okay if this is what you were rolling with like <laughs> thanks for informing and entertaining for 10 months <laughs> that's my artist rendering dog <laughs> my killer's never going to jail other atrocities now to be honest the raw footage of todd's whole confession was tedious to watch at times you see, Todd didn't want to write out his statement because he said he writes for a living and his hands hurt, and so the detectives had to stop him after every sentence and very slowly transcribe his confession. At one point even saying Todd uses big words and talks fast. Here's where things get super intriguing though. Many people argue that this was actually a deliberate interrogation tactic, and when you think about it, it makes sense. By playing dumb and making Todd feel like he's smarter than them, they subtly encourage him to keep talking freely and bragging about his accomplishments, not to mention repeating key details over and over again. And on the same token, while some people have questioned why detectives even needed to write down his answers in the first place, since the interview was being taped, others assert that suspects often don't realize they are being recorded, and having someone write down their words in front of them would make them feel even more secure that this conversation is not being permanently taped therefore making them feel comfortable sharing more risky details or side comments that they might not otherwise divulge. Okay, now this next part has nothing to do with crime, but it is super interesting to me because it feels like Todd is really basking in the feeling of being catered to while trying to seem humble and friendly with the detectives at the same time. I don't know, the whole thing just gives me a weird vibe because of how casual, unbothered, and almost giddy he's acting while confessing murders. What do you want for dinner? You missed dinner over there. That barbecue wasn't enough. Well, what do you want? Whatever you have for me. No, I'm asking you. What do you want? <laughs> uh, I won't be an asshole. Um, shut that door, Mark. You're not being an asshole. I'm, I'm telling. I'm asking you. What, what do you want for dinner? Uh, I don't know. We've. Uh, We've got, what do you got? around here. We've got Miami Grill around here. We've got we've, we've got the whatever you want, man. Boiling Springs cookout, whatever. What's your what do you like to eat? Cookout will work. I just that'll work. What do you like from cookout? Never been there. You just never, been there? Yes, sir. They have a really good. It's called a giant cheeseburger, um, giant fries, and a giant tea. Okay, to people who say. <clears throat> This is a technique that cops engage in where they like, you know, want more corroboration from the witness. And that's why they'll juice him up. He already gave him everything. They unironically don't need to be nice to him at this point. Like, or cooperation, not corroboration, sorry. Like, they're just chilling, dude. You want a big burger? It's the biggest. It's called Giant Cheeseburger. Let me tell you something. It's a fucking good ass burger. I'll tell you what, I'll get one too. There are actually a lot of moments sprinkled throughout where Todd seems just a bit too comfortable given the subject matter at hand. So he's going to win Trump or uh, Hillary? I'm scared to know. I mean, it's just a good way. But to be honest, there were times. Oh my God, dude. Oh my God. This is awesome. I'm scared to know. Oh, first of all, that's a dumb question. They're cops. Of course they were fucking Trump supporters. During the confession, when I did feel like I was watching buddies talk and it was a little surreal. God damn, even the fucking dude, even the narrator. And a lot of times narrators like this don't have like an automatic anti-cop bias like I do, which I admit. Even the fucking centrist ass YouTube channel narrators like, yeah, this was fucking weird. <laughs> I love that. Oh, he got one too. Bro, they're eating together. He got one too. Oh my God. Is that good? <laughs> I wouldn't steer you wrong, man. Bro, what is happening, bro? This guy literally kidnapped and murdered like hella people, dude. Yo, cops are... Okay, dude, I was so right. I'm sorry. I'm surprised that not a lot of people pushed back whenever I said, like, these cops are literally, like, one step away from being this guy, but they just have qualified immunity, the badge, 
and you know 50 pounds or whatever most people did not actually uh, push back on this i don't know if it's because they watched the video and they knew that they would inevitably be fucking embarrassed in the end because normally whenever i say shit like that there's always people in the chat that are like you're fucking wrong they're boys in the blue they're like the public servants fuck you this is literally this is this vindicating me in every way Like, they're, they're fucking, they're on a date, dude. Can you please look at my previous message important? If it's unimportant, I'm going to ban you. I cannot believe you did the top of the hour ad break coming your way, but while I have you here, might as well mention ways you can skip the ads, such as Twitch Prime, Real Money, or blocking them ads. Following since November 6, 2018. Oh. What the fuck? You've been following since November 6, 2018 and you only subscribe for four months? I should just ban you for that, dude. This motherfucker had the most free content, dude. This dude has got his money's worth. You know what I mean? If you subscribe to me for 12 months over the course of like 2020, you're, and you watched every single fucking piece of content that I put out, your subscription came out to 0 0.02 cents an hour. Okay? Like, you basically spent 0 0.02 cents. Or 0, it's just 2 cents an hour, basically. This guy has taken that to the maximum level. It's like 4 months subscriber since 2018. Which, by the way, I have no, uh, I have no problem with. I'm just, like, fucking around, obviously. You want to ban people for not subscribing when they follow you for quite a while? Guys, maybe you're new here. Like, I'm, I'm joking. Obviously, I would never fucking do that. I literally constantly talk about how you shouldn't subscribe unless you want to support the show or skip the fucking ads. Definitely don't subscribe if you think I'm going to call out your name or anything like that. But, like, you should know that by now. Like, I'm, I'm very clearly joking. I didn't see this person because they were a subscriber. I saw this person because they got my attention in the chat. Almost one year, that's crazy people has. <laughs> discriminating against the poor and uh, yeah no 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 i respect this this was actually pretty good it is top of the fucking hour okay and yes if you subscribe you you can avoid the the band hammer if you've watched if you've been watching since 2018 because i care about rich people and don't care about poor people you joke up you joke a lot but when you read dumb messages in chat you never think of that they, they might be joking i do I do. That's why. Actually, being a subscriber saves you in that situation. Because, like, if you're a 12 month subscriber and you say something and you forget to put, like, a cap or something on it, like, I will most likely not ban you because I'll know that you're trying to bait. Long time follower subscribe for a short amount of time instantly regrets it. I mean, it was a good debate. Here's the ad break now, by the way. I get the joke. It's great. To be fair, I would have subbed sooner, but during COVID, I was mega poor, living for $170 a month. No, I take my punishment. I'm sorry. Events. Wait, what the fuck? How are you? What happened, dude? You didn't get any fucking government assistance? What the fuck? That's crazy, dude. Yeah. If you want my attention, you got to have a good bait or, you know, be productive in the chat. You reward people for derailing content? Damn, this that's is a, crazy. Yeah, $170 a month is insane. I don't know. I think he's, like, making that up. Or lives in Zimbabwe. Uh, one of the two. I don't know what's going on there. Or is a kid. Thank Just you, anonymous time, user, for the five gift subs. My fam, it was decent. I'm just talking about self-suck for attention? Yeah, you do. Oh, he said $140 a week and no assistance. I got zero stimmy, no assistance. What the fuck? That's crazy. Anyway, let's keep going.
Oh my god! Are you fucking kidding me, dude? So he's gonna win Trump or uh we're running that back. But to be honest, there were times during the confession when I did feel like I was watching buddies talk and it was a little surreal. It's a hog day, brother. Are you kidding me? Yo, let's talk about my bitch wife, Bertha. You got a bitch ass ex wife, too? That's why I, you know, I, you know, I thought about kidnapping women myself. <laughs> I saw your Amazon reviews, brother. I think you got some good ideas on what to use. You know, I might be using them myself, actually, for restraints. Thank you, Admitted Flunky, for the 10 gifted subs. I'll do all that. Yeah, this guy literally, chat, for those of you who are just tuning in and you're like, what, what's up? Like, a cop and a fucking, you know, uh, a, a cop and a criminal are, like, having fun together, like... This guy literally murdered, raped, kidnapped, like, multiple women. Is it was just an hour ago talking about, like, a fucking quadruple homicide where he killed, like, like older women, you know what I mean? Like, um, thank you, admitted flunky, for another 10 gifty, boys. Well, the thing about it is, kids today, you know, they call them millennials. And they want everything handed to them at a buddy. And this is when I first realized it. And I didn't expect it from my generation. But if being friendly with Todd was enough to butter him up to spill the whole truth and put him behind bars for life, it was worth it. In the end, I think this statement from the investigator best sums up how authorities were able to treat Todd with kindness and respect despite the things he's done. The thing about it is... Like you said, there are cops in the world that are bad. There are cops in the world that are good. I should not like you. I should. J Ship, thank you for the five tier one gift subs. You didn't have to do that, you fucking psycho. I want to nail you to the cross. Mm -hmm. You know, but. But! What do you mean, but, motherfucker? This guy was a demon for like 20 years bro for since like 14 he's been like kidnapping and raping and doing psychopathic shit what do you mean but there's no but if you want to make the argument that there's good cops and bad cops like if there's any variation there with uh, respect to like morality and the police force you can't follow that statement with a but dude i'm going there anyway well let's know that but yeah i get it i, I, I want to do the right thing for you I want to make sure the right thing is done for you and by you. I don't do this job just to put people in jail and do stuff like that. I do this job because that's the way I want to be. Thank you, Mox, This man. next part of the conversation might give us the most valuable insight into Todd's headspace. So I'll let it play without commentary. I wonder how this is going to play out. 20 gifted. And Kev Ryan over the five gifted. Put me on Gurn. Mm -hmm. Which is what I'm expecting. That's what I'm expecting. Or, <clears throat> they're gonna put me in a Yes, it's that time of the day when everybody starts gifting randomly, but it's not really random. It's because someone gifted big, and then I fucking called it out. And then chatters are like, oh my god, he's calling out gifted subs. So it's time for us to fucking shower him with gifted subs so they'll call out my name. Thank you, Moda Gata, for the 12 tier 1 gifted subs. And Moxman for the 50 tier 1 gifted well, subs. See, this is what I'm like saying. Dude. And then uh, after a while, I just like get fatigued from fucking calling out everybody because it's like derailing content. So then I turn around and stop calling people's uh, names out. And then we have like another extended 10 minute stun lock over how I'm ungrateful because chatters are gifting a lot of uh, subs and I'm not calling their names out. And then we finally get back to the content. I'm literally pre-watching the stream. I'm pre-living the stream. I'm pre-streaming the stream. I'm basically doing everything ahead of time. Okay, I ran it out for you. Thank you, anonymous user, for the five tier one gifted subs.
Okay, yeah. Way too dank, baby. I'm pre-stun locked yeah. on the stun lock about what kind of stun lock we're about to have. This is the most meta shit, dude. I swear to God. Uh, this guy is fucking nuts, but Play hold on. Commentary. Oh, the one thing I was going to say is he's like talking about like, you know, I'm not going to mistreat you because, uh, you know, I, I got into this because uh, this is the way I want to be. It's like, dude, what do you mean? What about fucking justice for the victims? Like, I love that that does not go through the cop's mind at any point. Like, thank you, lol, in your face with the 5 3 one give the sub. Like, he literally never thinks to bring up the fact that, you know, there are victims out there and their families and he wants to do right by them he wants he's like i want to do right by you brother you, you know you Pogo. just a man trying to you know you, you were just a squirrel trying to get his nut you know what i'm saying brother we, we all have our moments i wonder how this is going to play out well, then. they're either going to put me on a burn mm -hmm. which is what i'm expecting <laughs> That's what I'm expecting. Or <clears throat> they're going to put me in a little box somewhere away from anybody and everybody, which I don't expect. I actually expect it earn. What do you want? I mean, all joking aside, I'll tell you, what do you want? Take me out back, shoot me back in the head? No, I wouldn't. I studied psychology a little bit in college. Mm -hmm. I want me to finish, like I said, I'm, trying to, I'm working on finishing college. <clears throat> The people at Superbikes made you angry. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You tell me, well, the people at Superbikes made you angry. And, and and not just angry, but, I mean, they belittled you. They humiliated you. They made you angry mm -hmm. enough to, to do what happened. Mm -hmm. And then you had this situation last, this last Christmas and then this most recent situation. Mm -hmm. The time span. Mm -hmm. What kept anything from happening you know because that's a question <clears throat> i don't need to kill chatter's making fun of a you know young psychology majors okay what do you mean dude he's just he's a psychology major brother this technique is called being bef finding a new friend okay you want to know what this technique is called by the cop it's called you know i'm a divorced dad too and uh, guess what you seem kind of all right that's that's what the fucking technique is. Well, I'm making you, friends technique. I mean, you know, you know, but that's a, that's a genuine question. I mean, per your legal definition, mm -hmm. I'm serial, but I'm not. Okay. Honestly, if Johnny had pulled the knife, mm -hmm. if he'd seen the knife, you'd laugh your ass off. Really? Oh, God. What, black and white tiger stripe. It was one of those. The handle? Well, time you buy it at the little convenience store? Are you serious? <laughs> I'm going, my ammo costs more than your, your damn knife. Are you kidding me? <clears throat> you cost me. Bro, no. Damn WTF. This is literally the greatest anti cop agit prop I could have shown you guys ever. Like, the cop literally went from, I'm doing this because this is the way I want to do. I'm not even thinking about the victims. To literally being like, hey, yo, fuck the victims, actually. I can't believe how poor that motherfucker was that you murdered. Lol. Like, he literally went from, like, one, not even bringing up the victims in general, which is, of course, an automatic solver board, to literally making fun of the victim. Yeah, you did a good rape on that other girl? Yep, that's right. Man, women are so fucking difficult to <laughs> deal with. Yeah, I know. I got a bitch ex wife, Bertha. Give me money. But you're going to stab me. At least stab me with a butt knife or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something with some, with something from the little history book. Yeah. 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 Do you really think that, or is that, are you just farming viewers? He's doing interrogation, dude. LMFAO, you can't be serious. I love this. I love this uh, kind of take because you're such a fucking bootlicker piece of shit that, like, you unironically, 
you unironically are fucking losing sight of the fact that he already conducted the interrogation. He's just like giving him food now and they're chummy and they're having fun. He already admitted to everything, you dumb fuck. You're really wise, man. All cops are bad people, Pepega. Dude, I love that, dude. Like, this is one video where you literally can't fucking defend this guy. Like, this is one video where this dude is indefensible in the way that he is, like, approaching this, like, multiple mass murderer, fucking mass rapist, serial rapist. And you're still having, like, you're still looking so desperately. Because you're not analyzing the situation correctly. Like, if you might have an anger about, like, a cab or whatever. But this is literally an instance where you can't make that argument. And yet you are still looking from your biased perspective to defend the cop and being like, oh my God, well, you know, he's actually doing an interrogation. He's not. He's not doing an interrogation at this point. They're just fucking having fun. They literally conducted the interrogation at this point. You're wrong. You're literally wrong. Sanchez have a really weird obsession with doing PR for cops. Yikes. No, he's not. He's not a Sanchez. That dude's probably a fucking uh, chud. There is no shot that that dude is like uh, just a Sanchez. He's probably a fucking uh, Republican or some shit. Yeah, he's just interrogating him, brother. Why does he suck his cock, dude? Yeah, policing is when giant cheeseburger party. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just happy, you Johnny. Okay. The problem is that you keep talking bad about all cops. Yeah, that's not a problem, brother. If that's a problem for you, you're at the wrong fucking stream, okay? Listen, at you can be a good person and you can be a cop, okay? A but you can't be you a good person you while you're a cop. There are very limited instances where you're actually doing the fucking right thing because by designation, your job, unfortunately, in the way that it's been created historically and the way that it's, uh, it, it works right now in contemporary society, it makes it impossible for you to be a good person while in the process of being a cop. There are plenty of unjustifiable laws that you have to uphold as a police officer, as an officer of the law, and therefore yeah, it is no functionally problem. impossible for you to be a good cop. That's what ACAB means. ACAB doesn't mean that like fucking every cop unconditionally is a piece of shit, awful human being. It just means that while you're a cop, you can be a good person overall, okay? Otherwise, you could have even joined the police force with honest intentions, things I talk about all the time. But while you are literally a fucking cop, and you, you put the badge on and you're, you're uh, fully subscribing to that culture, that behavior, that attitude, you get the fucking training. And then most importantly to that, you, uh, you do cop things. You're not going to be a good person. That's just the reality. You can jerk off to endless amounts of Hollywood footage that tell you like cops are fucking protecting the block and they're here to protect and serve. And actually they're putting their lives on the line, but ultimately they're not even, in the, they're barely in the fucking top 20 most dangerous professions in this country. Okay. They get away with murder. They get away with rape. They get away with a fucking litany of crimes. They're above the law. They treat, uh, uh, they treat poor neighborhoods, but specifically black and brown neighborhoods like an occupying force. They've literally gotten their training, the kettle and, and, and corralling strategy and the occupying force attitude from the Israeli Defense Force, the IDF, the occupying force in Israel. So that's the reason why they treat people like hostile fucking enemy combatants to a certain degree. They weren't great even before they got this fucking training. Post 9-11 is when they started getting the counterterrorism training, though. So ultimately, there are a multitude of different reasons as to why policing in this country is irreparably fucked. But you and other bootlickers like you who are like, oh, I'm so upset that you're talking down to cops, brother. Blue Lives Matter are making it virtually fucking impossible to make any sort of change. I don't give a fuck about the optics, okay? I don't care. You can cry about it all you fucking want. Be like, oh my God. Well, what about when they stop rapes or stop bullets? It's like, as though cops are like literally diving in front of dicks. You know what I mean? Like, oh, there's a rape happening. There's like a massive backlog of rape kits that have not been tested in this country. And you're like acting as though cops are, you know, not doing the rapes and instead fucking stopping the rapes from happening. Anyway, that's not their fucking job, dude. Their job is to actually protect and serve in theory. They just never ended up, they never ended up doing that. Stream. Police officers, unfortunately, under the capitalist organization of the economy, do not protect and serve the interests of the people. They protect and serve the interests of the capital. Okay? 
that's what they do. They protect and serve the interests of capital. That's why leftists consider cops to be class traitors. Cops are fucking strike breakers, okay? They help rats, scabs, cross the fucking picket line. They break protests down. They destroy free speech. They destroy any sort of fucking insurrection or any sort of fucking attitude that you might legitimately hold against the government. They exercise the state's monopoly of power, okay? Or, the, I mean, the, the state's monopoly of violence. That's what they do. That's what their fucking job is. Now, in theory, there is still a necessity for policing or some kind of fucking organization that does technically, uh, by presence, uh, uh, demonstrate that there is some laws and there is some order. Unfortunately, though, especially in a lot of black and brown communities, the presence of police is a demonstration of disorder and lawlessness. Okay, are you happy? Did you, did you really need to fucking hear all of this? Is that going to change your mind? Imagine a society without law and order. Yeah, that would be fucking terrible. Except cops don't fucking provide law and order in many of the circumstances that they uh, find themselves in. Okay. Their presence is lawlessness and disorder if they operate like they are above the law. Yee, brother. Anyway, I get really fucking annoyed when people are like, play Skyrim music over it. Shut up. Just fucking edit this part of the video and play your own goddamn Skyrim music over it. I'm, I'm sick and I'm really fucking annoyed that we, uh, you know, I made that joke one time. So now every single time I fucking talk about it, you literally are like, oh, yeah, play Skyrim music. Yeah, dude, let me stop in the middle of a fucking rant about policing to play Skyrim music because that's going to really, you know, hammer in the point. I don't give a fuck about cops. I just think it's stupid how biased you are against them. Just play the video already, man. Jesus Christ. You're so hot when you're mad. God damn. Oh, dude, this one is just a fucking horny simp. One year hassle. <laughs> he put that thing out, and I went, Here's how it's gonna go. Okay. Let's dance. <clears throat> and the other problem My best day today. is if it don't put me on the ground. Technology mm -hmm. as high as boot. What's your opinion on soldiers? Their job after all is to kill people? That's not even fucking correct. 80% of fucking what the American military uh, members do is literally just like sit on the back end. And also, I feel the exact same way as I do about cops as fucking soldiers that uh, members of the American military that like come in here and fucking say chud ass shit. I say worse shit about veterans than I do about fucking cops. Do you think, oh my God, if you think I fucking shit on cops, wait till you hear what I have to say about fucking veterans who are like, oh, fuck you. I'm defending your freedom of speech, you son of a bitch. Are you fucking kidding me? Wait, hold on. Talking to a goddamn veteran, you're, <laughs> you're talking to a goddamn veteran yourself. All right, you understand me? I'm a goddamn Korea War veteran, baby. Chatters are so new in here that they forget that like my most famous moment is literally fucking, you know, talking about uh, a a Purple Heart Navy SEAL who also happens to be a congressperson and making him cry on Fox News for 48 hours straight. This is a gigantic baby. Keep going. When the people inside realize the people I hunt is them. <clears throat> they'll, they'll be scared to death of you. Because I know the rest of my life, never heard of a person. I'm, just, I'm entirely okay with that. <laughs> it's a, like with super biased with this. It's just a reactional situation. Mm -hmm. Right, man? I wouldn't have ever heard of a person again. And for me to take myself, it's not hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can slam your throat on a, on a desk somewhere and crush the air, and you know and die of shitty death. Yeah. But you can do it. But you hurt the people. If I did any of that, and I won't, mm -hmm. it would probably cause my mother to have a heart attack and die. Yeah. As Todd was sealing his fate, investigators were conducting a thorough search of his property. They found a multitude of weapons and ammunition, such as handguns with silencers and rifles. But as there was no record of a background check under Todd's name for firearm purchases, it is believed that he illegally obtained these, which just adds to the laundry list of his crimes. 
In 2017, Todd Kolhab pleaded guilty to seven counts of murder, two counts of kidnapping, and one count of criminal sexual assault. He entered a plea bargain that spared him from capital punishment and instead was sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole, plus 60 years. Relatives of the Superbike shooting victims filed a wrongful death lawsuit against him, and Kayla has also filed her own civil lawsuit against Todd. She was awarded $6.3 million. However, even behind bars, Todd has not been silent. In late 2017, he wrote to the Spartanburg Herald Journal, claiming that he had more victims who have yet to be discovered, which would go along with what he told his mother right after he was caught. When she asked how many other victims there were besides the ones he confessed to, he apparently said, You do not have enough fingers. In the eight-page letter to the publication, Todd wrote, Yes, there is more than seven. I tried to tell investigators, and I did tell the FBI, but it was blown off. It's not an addition problem, it's a multiplication problem. Leaves the state and leaves the country. Thank you, private pilot's license. Yes, Todd apparently earned his pilot's license at some point and could have potentially traveled to commit more unsolved murders. But he has also expressed that at this point, he doesn't see any reason to give numbers or locations of other victims. At the same time, though, Todd reassured investigators in 2016 that he hadn't, in fact, killed anyone else. Have you killed anybody else in Spartanburg? No, sir. Have you killed anybody else in South Carolina? No, sir. Other than the, the boy in Arizona and Superbikes mm -hmm. and the ones that we have on the property, mm -hmm. have you killed anybody else? And this is where I ask you this. Is that enough? I do, but no, 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 this is the thing. No, this is the thing. This is not to drive a nail home or anything like that, okay? You had your moment in here with your mom, and I, I, this is your opportunity to get everything. It, it's not, you, you know what I'm saying? It's an opportunity to get everything out of the way, you know? Because you're going to be sitting in, in a cell. Mm -hmm. And, and there's going to be lonely times, and right. and you're a compassionate person. Mm -hmm. I'm a compassionate person. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the heat of the moment, when somebody pisses you off, you may want to beat the shit out of them, shoot them, stab them, kill them, whatever. Mm -hmm. But when you're laying there at night, it's gonna, it may bother you. You, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's the only reason I'm asking. That's the only one shot. That's the only one you shot. Okay. Um. I didn't want to have to explain numbers on the phone. I sure didn't want to give numbers of four. Wait, did I miss it? I was petting Fiona. I'm sorry. I needed to take a little break from fucking the hogs being like, you did great murders. I love the way you work, sir. What, what did he say to the fucking... Oh, God. Carolina. No, sir. Uh, then I'm sorry, I gotta run that again. I was I was literally just fucking laying with Fiona and, and giving her pets and kisses. Conservation of energy in social. You know, sometimes you gotta take away from getting more. You gotta fucking move away from the cop being like, hey, you know. Five year progress. I love doing protection and service for the people by you know doing exactly what you do, but this time I'm hiding behind a badge. The boy in Arizona and superbikes mm -hmm. and the ones that we have on the property. Have you killed anybody else? Ten months ago, and this is where I ask you this. Is that enough? I do, but no, 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 this is the thing. No, this is the thing. This is not to drive a nail home or anything like that, okay? You had your moment in here with your mom, and I, I, this is your opportunity to get everything. It, it's not, you, you know what I'm saying? It's an opportunity to get everything out of the way. You know, because you're going to be sitting in, in a cell, mm -hmm. and, and there's going to be lonely times, and right. and you're a compassionate person. Mm -hmm. I'm a compassionate person. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the heat of the moment, when somebody pisses yeah, no, that's that is actually a technique. Isn't it called like uh, what do you something up? No, that's literally a technique. I mean, we know this guy's a piece of shit. Like the cop is actually a fucking yeah ego up. He's doing the ego up technique. Yeah, like that's that's entirely different. He's like that that is actually survey. Like what he's doing there is an interrogation and he's also using uh, the ego up technique to appeal to his fucking uh you know sensibilities, make it seem like he's a compassionate person. No, the interrogation isn't over here.
Now we got a nice The interrogation isn't over here. Uh, <laughs> him laughing and chumming it up with him while he eats a giant burgle is way makes me way more uncomfortable way 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 more uncomfortable than this this is normal this is you off you may want to beat the shit out of them shoot them stab and kill them whatever mm -hmm. but when you're laying there at night it's gonna it may bother you you, you see what i'm saying mm -hmm. and that's the only reason i'm asking that's, that's the only one you shot they're responsible for putting this guy behind bars he would have killed and raped more people otherwise dude Cops need reform, not defunding our freaking abolishment, dude. This is called, the chatter didn't listen to anything that this political commentator has ever said or understands the complex opinions he has on uh, policing in America and policing worldwide. So the chatter is actually creating a completely fabricated approach that he suspects the streamer has technique. Okay. That's what it is. That's what that. That's what that take is, dude. Okay. Um. I didn't want to have to explain numbers on the phone. I sure didn't want to give numbers of four. So when you told mom, she didn't have enough I fingers. Know, I just didn't know what to tell her on the phone. Okay, so that was kind of not. A, I don't want to say embellishment, but it was just something to. Didn't want to give her phone numbers. What is this? I gotcha. I gotcha. Okay. Definitely more hand, more than one hand, but um, it's not really a bragging kind of. Oh my god, I got Austin to paint his fucking nails, dude. I mean, mine is like done now. I don't have it anymore, but that's hilarious. Here with the big man, Paul my man. That's sick, dude. I wonder how many people I like. I wonder how many guys I got to paint their nails. My impact, dude. What's he saying? They're responsible for putting this guy behind bars. He would have killed. Oh. He said, what the hell? Chatter, you must be new here. I understand. Some of these knuckleheads may call that, ooh, that's cool. I, I don't really call that cool. Hey, Todd, a while ago you made a statement that said, that when you, you just said, those are the only people I've shot. Mm -hmm. Any other memes? Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you think? On one hand, it does seem a little suspicious that there would be a 13-year lull in between the superbike shooting and Todd's next victims. But I can also see how Todd might just be showboating in a bid to get more attention now that his case has died down. But get this, some people actually think that Todd may not have even really committed the superbike murders. All right, strap in, because what? now I'm going to take you through some of the- Come on, dog, this video's got six minutes left. You can't do a, you can't do a plot twist with six minutes remaining. This video was really good, by the way. I totally understand why you guys were like adamant that I watch. This was, this was one of the best like JCS style videos that we watched. The more controversial internet theories and conspiracies that have arisen around this case. Just a disclaimer, I'm not endorsing these theories in any way, but I think it's really fascinating to see the information people have dug up and the wildly different conclusions they've come to. So, about the superbike murders, a woman named Pat Brown, who is a profiler claiming to have worked on this case in the past, has written about her doubts. She says a serial killer that is also a mass murderer is not what you would normally expect, because serial killers like to have complete control over their victims. She also feels that there is no actual evidence beyond a potentially false confession that Todd was the perpetrator in this case. And she even asserted that the sheriff was up for re-election around the time Todd confessed. And this may have been a convenient way to solve that cold case in the nick of time. However, a counterpoint to this idea is that Todd mentioned a detail in his confession that apparently was never released to the public before, when he said that he shot each of the victims in the forehead. So investigators feel pretty confident that he was the one behind the crime. But still, Pat refutes this claim and actually says that none of the victims were shot in the forehead. There's honestly so much to go into here, but to me, it seems like- I mean, he fucking lied about how like the dude attacked him with a knife and stuff too. He very clearly embellishes the of crime to be fighting fit over that narrative that like, you know, Santa these are actually month. legal kills. These are actually kills that are like warranted. You know what I mean? It's just a very chud thing to do. That's why he's doing it. Cause it's just a fucking chud. You ignored my $10 donation of environmental indoctrination. What the fuck was it, dude? It's kind of your fault, dude. Just write it in the fucking chat.
like Tony. Todd's motive and explanation of this crime were clear, so I'll let you decide what you think really happened. And then another conspiracy theory people have posited centers around Kayla herself. This one is rather sensitive, and I again want to emphasize that I don't subscribe to these beliefs and would never do anything to blame the victim as what she had to go through was undoubtedly unimaginable. With that being said, here is the theory some people propose. When Kayla appeared on Dr. Phil to talk about the case, she said that she met Todd on Facebook several years before, uh -oh. and they had had little contact besides a few messages here and there, where he would ask how she's doing before he ultimately contacted her about the job opportunity. However, according to the Newberry Observer, an initial interview at Todd's so residence between Todd and an investigator suggested that there may have been more to the relationship. The alleged transcript of that exchange shows the investigator asking Todd if Kayla was a stripper who would also sleep with Todd for money, which Todd claims is true. He also apparently claimed that he'd taken her to dinner and that she'd spent the night at his house before, among other physical encounters. So these details have apparently led some online circles to speculate that Kayla could have known more than she was letting on about the whole situation. Wait, so what? Some people have come up with this theory. You mean people on Reddit, I think, right? This just strikes me as like straight out of fucking red pill. Like literally an incel theory, dude. Because like 11 months, BB. Critical incel theory. <laughs> yeah, true. It's like you, you want to know how it's like 100% an incel theory? Because like even if it's true, it's still doesn't mean anything like but to an incel it's like well maybe she was a sex worker okay so who cares like he still kidnapped her dude you have to be like a real psycho to to be like oh well if he, if she was a stripper that must mean maybe she wanted to be kidnapped and raped you know what i mean like you literally have to be a fucking psycho to be like well her being a sex worker implies that maybe there was more to the story after all it's like yeah okay there was a little bit more that she was also that was her occupation let's say if it's true Jesus fucking christ all you do for your entire streams is bitch and call people names you're such a piece of shit bro you literally sit there watch and then desperately try to get me to try to get me to fucking pay attention to you that's so much sadder than what i do dude thanks for the subscription though who cares if you think you're right? You're a terrible person. Bad take. Variants are coming from shitter third world countries that are too corrupt to vaccinate their people. What? Oh my God. Fighting with mental illness and being technically homeless. I've seen and had to deal with a lot of scummy people who hate me just because of the situation I'm in. Why aren't you allowed to point out black people had a hand in enslaving themselves though? Which is considered the state many countries within Africa. What the fuck? So this person is like a mentally ill homeless person who's also like a racist? Like what's going on? Yeah. I hate that like, uh, you know, the Delta variant was created because of, uh, you know, the corruption in the corruption in third world countries. And certainly not because, Yo, I'm sub. you know, they just did not have the means to be able to get all the vaccines because we fucking bought all of them but he but he has five dollars to sub yeah that's crazy dude if you're literally fucking homeless like don't waste your money on me dude what the fuck i think the same exact thing about sharia law you take part in it you're a scumbag <laughs> oh god i want to fucking stop before we finish this and i want to show you something that iron stash posted It looks fake. That's in Greece. No, Miki is there, really? Hey, at least they have fucking planes to take care of this uh, problem, you know what I mean? All right, let's Especially considering those letters she had allegedly written to Todd during her capture. Other updates that have added fuel to this fire include the fact that Kayla in 2019 was charged with third-degree criminal domestic violence after a fight between her and her boyfriend. 
Kayla claimed that during an argument, the man bucked his chest into her. Then she struck him in the face with a closed fist, and then he allegedly slammed her to the ground and put her in a headlock. The charge was her first criminal charge in South Carolina and was eventually dismissed. <clears throat> However, people still drew attention to another tragedy that occurred in her life about five months before this incident. At that time, her then fiance shockingly died of a self-inflicted stab wound to the chest. All of these factors have caused some internet communities to turn a suspicious eye on Kayla, but at the same time, most recognize that she is still trying to- Dude, that take alone is like, like that, you, you fucking don't need to post that. Like the moment you post that uh, comment- dismissed. However, people still drew attention to another tragedy that occurred in her life about five months before this Hold incident. Hold on, I gotta show you that, that Facebook time, comment. her then fiance shockingly died of a self-inflicted stab wound to the chest. All of these factors have caused some- No one doesn't say she's in a victim, but how much of a victim is she? Bro, you're literally a psycho, dude. I mean, this is, this is literally victim blaming, dude. What the fuck? I mean, he's- <laughs> oh my god, is this actually victim blaming? The moment that you find your the moment that you find yourself asking the question like, well, how much of a victim is this person? That's like I I'm admittedly calling a victim. That's when you know you've strayed away from uh, God's uh, good graces internet communities to turn a suspicious eye on Kayla, but at the same time, most recognize that she is still trying to heal from the traumatic experience she endured at the hands of Todd Kolhep. I think everyone can agree that even if we don't have the full picture of Kayla's life, she was still a victim who did not deserve any of the horrible things that happened to her during that kidnapping. And I hope she is doing well today, or at least getting the help she needs to work back towards a normal life. Further updates following Todd's arrest have failed to show any growth nor regret on his part. In a hearing, shocking. Family members of the Superbike victims got to make statements directly to Todd, and after one mother spoke about how Todd was frustrated that he couldn't ride a bike properly and said her son would have been happy to show him how, Todd actually spoke up to say, With all due respect, ma'am, I'm sorry, but your information is incorrect. The judge reminded him he was only allowed to speak if he had a question for the mother. Todd apparently remarked, I want to let her know why it happened. Jeez, I bet you could have heard a pin drop in that room. Todd is certainly one of the most psychologically intriguing killers I've ever heard of. According to a forensic psychologist who was interviewed about 130 serial killers, Todd wanted to believe he was a good guy. He apparently doesn't want to be associated with the worst serial killers and has said, I'm not a bad person, but I do bad things sometimes. It seems he justifies his murders in his head by classifying people into categories of good or bad. But obviously, it's a childish mindset to have when you think you can judge people's character and decide their life or death based on how it suits you. Perhaps his twisted personal philosophy and complete lack of remorse was best summed up when he told detectives, I've never done anything to anybody who didn't have it coming. Todd Kolhep's story is especially disturbing, I think, because in the eyes of most people who knew him, he was just a normal dude outgoing and charismatic even, and at the very least, successful. He's a guy you probably wouldn't give a second look if you passed him on the street, and you'd probably walk away from a conversation with him thinking he's a chatty, decent guy. And maybe that's the most scary part of all, is wondering how many monsters like Todd are hidden in plain sight. What a sense of entitlement looks like? No, we already did the Randy Stare one, and I, I want to move away from a fucking... <laughs> like this video, please subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. <laughs>